evening. I'm calling to order this meeting of the Arlington Select Board on Monday, May 22nd. I am Select Board Chair Eric Helmuth. Tonight's meeting is being conducted in a hybrid format consistent with Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023, signed into law on March 29th, 2023, which further extends certain COVID-19 measures regarding remote participation in public meetings until March 31st, 2025. Before we begin, please note the following. First, this meeting is being conducted in the select board chambers and over Zoom. It is being recorded and simultaneously broadcast on ACMI. Second, persons wishing to join the meeting by Zoom may find information on how to do so on the town's website. Persons participating by Zoom are reminded that you may be visible to others and that if you wish to participate, we ask you to provide your full name in the interest of developing a record of the meeting. Third, all participants are advised that people may be listening who do not provide comment and those persons are not required to identify themselves. Both Zoom participants and persons watching on ACMI can follow the posted agenda and materials found on the town's website, specifically the select board agendas and minutes page. Let's see how much of the town's business we can get done tonight. Before we begin, I'm glad to see people here in the room and on Zoom as well. Uh, regarding public participation this evening, we do have an open forum, which is um, after item 10. And um, that's the opportunity for uh, residents of the town or anyone who's here or, or who is on Zoom to make a comment to the board about whatever you'd like. Uh, there's a three minute time limit for that. And uh, what it will do when we get there is if you're watching on Zoom and you want to participate in open forum, wait for me to announce that and then be ready in Zoom to raise your hand. So if you don't know how to raise your hand in Zoom, now would be an excellent time to Google that so that you're ready to go. Um, because raising your hand on Zoom will get you on the meeting list and of course people here in the room can really actually raise their hand and come to the microphone at that time and just remember to give your name. And um, so that's the extent of the public participation. That comes before most of our other business. The other items that we're discussing tonight don't have a specific public hearing or public comment for them. So if you have anything to say about that business, open forums your time. All right, first item on tonight's agenda is a pleasure. So I was at the pleasure to be at, uh, well, were you there Friday? Yes, with yes. Mr. Hurd at the retirement ceremony on Friday for our retiring uh, Veteran Services Director, Jeff Chunglo. And um, I surprised him with the news that his colleagues suggested quite rightly that the Select Board issue a proclamation in his honor. And um, he said he wanted to send his regrets that he couldn't be here tonight because he's in his new home state closing out a home today. But uh, we'll hand this to him on Memorial Day. He is gonna come back to Arlington for that. So select board, um, I hope will vote in a few minutes on the following. Whereas Mr. Jeffrey A. Chunglow has served with distinction as the town's director of veteran services since February 3rd, 2014, providing exemplary services and tireless support to the town's veterans, including creating and chairing Arlington's Veterans Council. And whereas Mr. Chunglow went beyond the call of duty for all Arlington residents by assisting in vaccination clinics and PPE distribution during the COVID-19 pandemic and Whereas Mr. Chunglu elevated the Flags on Graves program, the Memorial Day, Veterans Day, and Patriots Day celebrations, coordinated numerous military honors for veterans, established the War on Terrorism Monument in Mount Pleasant Cemetery, and spearheaded plans to renovate Veter Veterans Memorial Park at Broadway Plaza, and whereas Mr. Chunglu joined the Navy Reserves in 1996, served with Bravo Company 125th Marines, 4th Marine Division from 1996 to 2004, as the company corpsman, earning his fleet Marine Force designator, supported Operation Bulldog at Marine Corps Officer Candidate School, Quantico, Virginia in 2006 and 7, and in 2007, serving as company corpsman overseeing field medical operations. He was selected for Chief Petty Officer in June 2007 and deployed as the Battalion Medical Chief for Dable Mobile Construction Battalion 27 from June 2008 to June 2009. He was selected in the role of Senior Chief Hospital Corpsman, Fleet Marine Force, in 2011, and he was hand-selected by the Bureau of Medicine and Surgery to serve as senior non-commissioned officer in charge of the Deployed Warrior Medical Management Center in Lenstel, Germany. He served as a senior enlisted leader for Ex Expeditionary 
Medical Facility, Bethesda, and a Senior Enlisted Academy, Newport, Rhode Island, serving as an adjunct professor until his retirement in July 2017. And, whereas, Mr. Chungla has been awarded the Meritorious, Meritorious Service Medal, Navy and Marine Corps Commendation Medal, the Navy and Marine Corps Achievement Medal, the Navy Unit Commendation Medal, seven of the former and two of the latter, uh, the Global War on Terrorism Medal and multiple personal and unit awards, and whereas Mr. Chunglo is the acclaimed author of The Rescue of Boxer 22, and whereas Mr. Chunglo is an avid Patriots fan and was named one of the New England Patriots Fans of the Year, and whereas Mr. Chunglo is the loving husband of Diane Chunglo, devoted father to David Chunglo and his wife Jacqueline, and adoring grandfather to Connor, as well as honorary father to Addie and Chance. Now, therefore, let it be resolved that we, the members of the Select Board, do hereby proclaim the first day of June, 2023, Jeff Lee A. Chunglo Day in the town of Arlington. We honor and thank him for his bravery, service, and sacrifice on behalf of the town and his residents. At this point, I would entertain a motion and discussion from my colleagues. Move approval. Second. Motion of approval from Mrs. Mahan, a second from Mr. Hurd. Any discussion? Mrs. Mahan. Um, there's a lot I could say about Jeff Chunglo. Um, he's above and beyond the, uh, the position that he held, and not only for the veterans here in Arlington, but literally throughout the state and the region. I, I can't tell you how many times um, I remember one story. I was in, in, in Burlington, and I saw this gentleman who was driving for a particular hotel, and he looked really downtrodden and just said hi. And uh, I sort of was the right person in the sense of hearing in the right time. Um, and he, he is a veteran. And I said to him, listen, we have this fantastic guy, Jeff Chunglo. He's a veteran. He gets it. He has connections with the Patriots with the Red Sox, with the foundation to be named later, covers the whole gamut, medical, uh, emotional services, uh, employment, everything, and made a call to uh, Jeff Chunglo, uh, passed it off to him, and uh, it's amazing how he was able to uh, provide the services for a non-Allington resident. I know Winchester called him a lot, Belmont. I called him on at least a dozen other occasions um, to that. And he really is so effective in his job because he operates as an unsung hero. Because when you're in a position and you need help, um, A, you hope you find the right woman or man that, that can help you, but also that they get you the help versus making you their cause. And um, I, I can see all the different names of people that I uh, connected with Mr. Chungwell that um, he just uh, garnered through and really, really went beyond. And I know one of the things they really appreciated, he did it just because um, it wasn't to, you know, divulge to the public or anything like that. So, A, it's really a great loss. And I do want to say I made sure um, when Mr. Chungwell would uh, bring different veterans to Memorial Day to speak, one of the things they always started to say, first I want to thank the person that is just as important, if not more, Diane. And, and people would look to me because the same name. And no, it was his wife, Diane, um, who also, when we had various, whether you were dignitaries or just a regular old veteran, um, Jeff and Diane are part of a team. And um, we were very fortunate that she also came as a package deal with him. And she also gave so much service to the town and this board last year um, recognized her, which she didn't want, <laughs> at last day, year's memorial service and gave her um, a few gifts to, to thank her also for her service. So uh, a great loss. Uh, it's my understanding he's sort of going to keep his toe dipped in the Arlington Pond um, as much as he can. And um, I know I'll be talking to Jeff again soon. Unfortunately, couldn't make it on Friday. but circumstances didn't allow me. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Diane. Mr. Hurt. Thank you. As Mrs. Mahan said, I think we could all talk for an hour about Mr. Chungo and the work he's done in Arlington. For me, when I was chair was from 2020 to 2021, which was the remote era of human life. And 
it, during that period, the, a lot of events just didn't happen. They just they got canceled and they got forgotten. And I was always really impressed at the creative ways Jeff came up with, you know, events to still continue to honor veterans during that period. I think one time we spoke in town hall to an empty auditorium. Uh, one time we filmed out in the town hall garden. But he never let the pandemic affect his job and his duty to honor the veterans in Arlington. So I appreciate that about that Jeff did, and he was a tireless advocate for veterans, and it's certainly a, a large loss to the town and a big gap to fill. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Mr. Hurd DeCourcy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, and I also want to echo the, the comments of my colleagues. Um, Jeff will be sorely missed, and, and I, I was going to relay a story from the pandemic, too. And, and during my time as chair, the Memorial Day event was by video, and, and Jeff coordinated everything to the point of each one of the speakers spoke at a different part of the cemetery. With I was being, the War on Terror Memorial was behind me. There was others at, near the World War One Memorial, near the World War Two, and, and the Korean War Memorial. And he coordinated everything because it was so important to have that event and continue to, to honor our veterans. And, and just a personal story: my, my father-in-law was a World War Two veteran, and uh, he passed away and uh, my mother-in-law and, and uh, my wife and her family coordinated with Jeff for honors at, at his funeral and uh, he was a real source of comfort to my mother-in-law arranging for that and, and we always appreciated that and his thoroughness and, and thoughtfulness and I know during the pandemic he was at the clinics as, as Mrs. Mahan said he was coordinating the distribution of masks, picking them up at hospitals, bringing them to, to, to different people who were in need. So I, uh, um, this is certainly a well-deserved honor. The proclamation, we can't really pay him enough for, for what he has done for the community, but um, we'll, we'll have another opportunity to see him. And uh, hopefully, as Mrs. Mahan said, he will stay, uh, have his foot uh, d dipped in the pond here. And uh, thank you, Jeff, so much for, for your service. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And so in my year, we were coming out of the pandemic. And, uh, and actually, the previous year, when we um, were doing the Veterans Day event over at the firehouse, I mean, people pointed out how Jeff had, had taken Veterans Day to uh, another level I mean, in, in terms of I mean, the celebration that we did. And, and I had the idea I mean, um, to do a luncheon. And I didn't talk about this during the campaign, you know, because it really is something that I, mean, I was proud to work on with Jeff. but. And it was one of the things that I felt was a nice accomplishment, but I didn't want to say it during the campaign because I didn't want it to seem like I, mean, I was trying to use I mean, veterans I mean, to, to um, as part of the desire to get reelected. You know, but I really enjoyed working with Jeff on that I mean, and Food Link. You know, and, and what's really great about it was that, in a sense, it's like it didn't pan out the way we wanted. There was a complication, I mean, but Jeff was able to, to pivot I mean, and still and be able to uh, provide food for the veterans. But beyond that, what was even better was that uh, he pulled together this educational program for the veterans. I mean, one, to let them know about the new Veterans Memorial that we're planning. I mean, hopefully it'll get funded and everything. But even more importantly, um, about the um, Camp Lejeune um, Act, you know, and, and uh, the need to be cautious about the commercials. And I think even better than feeding people food is really feeding their minds. I mean, and so I thought he made a really, really good event out of it. And so he, you know, when I brought up the idea to him, he was all in on it, you know, and, and um, helped to coordinate things. I mean, and so, so um, it's, you know, to do something like that requires another level of bravery, you know, but he was, he was all for it. You know, and like I said, when things didn't go as we planned, you know, he really just came accommodated, adapted very easily to it, you know, so, so um, we'll definitely miss him, you know, but, but, you know, he, he's alive and healthy, you know, and, and he'll be, you know, working with us still, you know, so, so we'll move on. Uh, thanks. Thank you all. Everybody who ever encountered Jeff has a, a Jeff Chungla story, and it's a good one. I said at his, um, his affair on Friday that did a lot of people at Town Hall, I've served in town for a long time, and including myself, there are very few people who I've never, you never hear a negative thing about. <laughs> we all do things that manage to annoy people. And somehow, Jeff, you just never heard a bad word about the man. Jeff, you are grateful for you. I know that I hope that you'll watch this uh, later and uh, know that we will miss you. 
and uh, we hope that you do stay in touch. So on a motion by Mrs. Mahan and seconded by Mr. Hurd, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? It is unanimous. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Chair, I'm sorry, may I? Of course, Attorney Heim. Uh, I believe we have a member. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I see that Mr. Jiggins in the chamber. My apologies. <laughs> Thank you for your due diligence, sir. He also sees me online. That's why he was. Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yes, yeah. yeah. Huh. We're just keeping you on your tones, toes, Mr. Heim. <laughs> Next item is the consent agenda. Uh, this is, uh, we'll vote this all at once, and uh, we have the minutes of the meeting from May 8th, the Arlington Soapbox Derby local race on June 10th, and the race director, Mr. Barr, is here. Thank you, sir, for your efforts. If anyone has any questions, they can certainly ask him. Request for the contractor drain layer license by Henry Perez, request for a special one-day beer and wine license uh, for a private event by Laurie Francis, and also another one by Emily Zhu, request for a uh, a third one at the Woodmore Robbins House by Steve McHugh. Move approval. Second. And any discussion or questions? Mr. Barr, want to talk about the race? Sure, Mr. Barr, if you'd like to talk about the race, thank you. I'd like to give you a chance to promote it. Sure, I will. I promise. Unlike my normal behavior, I'll try to be brief. Just um, introduce yourself, please. Uh, sorry. Uh, sure. Joseph Barr, um, 24 Park Street, uh, a town meeting member from Precinct 5, and the race director for the Arlington uh, Soapbox Derby local race, which this year will be happening on June 10th at our normal location uh, on Eastern Avenue between Robbins Farm Park and the Brackett School. Um, and we, as always, continue to appreciate the town's great support for this uh, in terms of closing the road, uh, helping us out with resources from police and DPW, and also just the support of the um, you know, people, folks who live in the town. It's a great event, um, both for the kids and the families that participate. My son John is here, and they've been racing. Uh, sorry, excuse me. My child John um, is here, and they've been racing um, since um, – they were seven years old, um, so going on 10 years. Um, and it's been both a great experience for them in terms of the fun they've had, but also in terms of leadership development uh, and all the, the friends they've made. And so, you know, if, if you have any questions for an actual racer, they know more than I do. I've never raced a box derby car. They have. Um, so I can't tell you about the experience. But in any case, don't want to hold you any longer or take up any more of your time. I know you have a long agenda, but happy to answer any questions. And But just as a reminder, we'd love to see as many folks as can make it out there on June 10th. We start racing around 9, 9.30 a.m., usually ends early afternoon, um, and it's a great event, you know, particularly if the weather's good and we get um, you know a nice sunny day. It's sort of about as all-American as you can get uh, when we're out there, so it's a great, a great time. So I encourage any of the select board members, members of the community, town staff, whoever, please show up and, and cheer the racers on. Can you just tell us again where? Uh, yes, so it's in front. Uh, it's on Eastern Ave. Uh, we, um, I forget the names of the streets. Uh, I should know them. But basically between the Brackett School and e Robbins Farm Park, um, you know, kind of starting at the top of the hill just below the, the water tower, and then we finish um, right, uh, right where the crosswalk between the park and the, um, and the school is down by their playground. Well, both playgrounds, actually. So. Thank you. Mm -hmm. No, I just say briefly, I think we've been approving this since I've been on the board. And I never got an opportunity to see it until and then we finally went down with my two boys last year. And it was an incredible event. It was fun to watch. Great. They certainly wanted to participate, but with hockey and baseball and stuff, to find the time to uh, build a, a racer. But I think every year the question is, how do they stop? And I actually got to see it. And they do stop. They do stop. So, so they don't crash into the hay bales well, every time. But sometimes. While, but but it was fun to watch. That's it. a longer and story. We won't certainly everyone that. that was watching in the races had fun. So yeah. happy to support it. That's great. And I, I will say, um, actually, last year, unfortunately, due to some organizational issues, we actually didn't hold our race. So we had it in 2021. 22. Didn't have it last year. Uh, we did have a I, – I just um, – I'll, I'll apologize on behalf of the – organization because there was a little bit of a mix-up with DPW and the police and they still thought we were having the race and so I got a call at 6 30 a.m. on the day when the race was supposed to happen saying where are you and I was like we're not having a race and they're like oh we're out here with cones and I was like oh god so apologies to um, the, both the DPW and the police for the, that mix-up last year but we're definitely on for this year. So. Mr. Dickens. Well I'm a STEM guy but I'm also a STEAM guy, so I'm thinking that you probably fit an A in there, you know, and have some like kind of artistic 
you know, element to it, you know, you know, uh, so, so, you know, I'm sure it's already there, you know, so, so. Yeah, well, one, one of the things, that the kids, in, in some of the divisions, the kids do get to decorate their own cars or choose the decoration of their cars. So, for example, John's car, their, their older car looked like, uh, looked like an orca, it was painted like an orca because that's their favorite uh, animal. And this one, um, we're hoping if we can get our act together with the painting, different car will have some um, pride uh, celebration on it. So. See, I knew it was already there. I mean, so, just, just so there is an opportunity for both STEM and STEAM. Yeah, cool. Thank you. And I, I must say, given that, that I live on Grandview Road, which is about two blocks from the top of the race, I have no excuse. And uh, it's one of my favorite things <laughs> to amble down and do on a, on a nice early summer day, so I look forward to it. And we do appreciate the patience of the neighbors who live on Eastern Ave and the side streets, because obviously oh, yeah. it's disruptive. <laughs> For them, we, we fly or we put up no parking signs, so it all works out great. But again, I do want to mention they're always very, very supportive and very patient with the, the street closure. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Barr. Okay, so the, for the consent agenda, we have a motion. Just one, oh, Mrs. One, just one thing, course, not on this, thank you. Um, just very briefly, I usually don't do this in this part of the agenda, but I saw for the three events, two are weddings, congratulations to the uh, happy couples. But there's also a celebration of life of um, one of my former parents from Brackett School, um, when I first took over as uh, PTO president, which I swore I would never do. I swore I would never run for elected office, so. I don't know what that means, but uh, when I first came to Brackett and, and really experienced a turnaround, two of the very first parents that not only signed up to volunteer, but were so active and left such an imprint on the Brackett school community and hung with me for five years, <laughs> they kept voting me back into president, was uh, Sue and Steve McHugh. And I, I see that there's a celebration of life um, uh, as, as one of the requests for Susan McHugh, who uh, was a professional, you know, was a mom, wife, professional woman, had so many things on her plate, but in terms of our curriculum, our cultural enrichment, our reading program, getting volunteers, along with her husband Steve, but I like to call her the dynamo, um, the brains, and the beauty behind the, the couple. Um, and uh, I was so saddened to, to hear of her passing, but I do see there is a an event for a celebration of her life. And I really do appreciate when I first started getting involved in schools and then the town, um, those were two of the first people. So thank you for, to Mr. Chairman and my colleagues for letting me kind of go astray there a little. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Mahan. That was lovely. Any other discussion on the consent agenda? Okay, so on a motion for approval of all items on the consent agenda by Mrs. Mahan and seconded by Mr. DeCourcy. All in favor, say aye. 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 I don't know why I raised my hand when I do that. It just feels like the thing to do. Yeah. I'm not swearing myself in. Right. Next item. Item. Thank you, Mr. Barm. Item nine. Um, acceptance of the Minuteman Bikeway Wayfinding sign donation from the Arlington Chamber of Commerce. And we have a guest star, <laughs> <laughs> Kelly Linema, on behalf and recently of the planning department. I believe we also have Mrs. Log. Please. Thank you, thank you, um, thank you, members of the select board. Thank you for having me tonight. Um, I do have a short presentation. I don't know if we can pull that up. Um, I'll try to go Thanks. through this fairly quickly, but it's also part of your packets tonight. Um, so the main reason we're here tonight is to request the select, board, select board's acceptance of a gift from the Chamber of Commerce, but this is also related to a project that's also that's happening in Arlington Heights. Um, so I'll give this just a minute. This is the Minuteman Bikeway Wayfinding Project. Sorry. That's okay. That's all right. Um, so the background of this project is it really stems back to the pandemic. And, Ali, and thanks to Ali Carter and Daniel Amsatz, who also worked on this project, um, this was as this came about because of the local rapid recovery plan. And that plan, one of the key recommendations of that plan was that businesses in East Lexington, in Bedford Center, and in Arlington Heights should capitalize on their proximity to the Minuteman Bikeway. And really wanting to draw users of the Minuteman Bikeway into the business districts. I don't know if you've ever been into that area underneath Park Ave Extension, but it's really hard to even realize that there is a business district and actually a thriving business district and a growing business district right by that area. And so the key recommendation of that plan was that we develop a wayfinding program. And it's really about economic development. So how can we 
it not just have people who are going by on Mass Ave understand that there's a business district here, but how can we also have that be part of the, the what's driving people from the bikeway to the business district and then back onto the bikeway again? This was also a key recommendation of the Miniman Bikeway Planning Project, which was led by Daniel Amstutz, um, which recommends a quarter-wide project for wayfinding. And then in 2022, Allie Carter and Jenny Raitt received, with Lexington and Bedford, the Middlesex 3 Redo Grant. So this was money to actually do the implementation. So with this funding through Lexington, we hired Jeff Dawson, who's also here tonight on Zoom, um, to design and develop a wayfinding project for, East, for Arlington Heights and East Lexington and Bedford um, by the rail station. Since then, Beth Locke has said that she has received an earmark, which if you have any questions about, she can go into more details, but we want to extend this wayfinding system into Arlington Center and East Arlington because by doing that, we will have a cohesive and quarter-wide wayfinding system that goes from um, Alewife Station all the way out to Bedford Center. So the priority locations for this are, um, if you go to the next slide, Arlington Heights, and this is funded by the Redo Grant, so this is completely grant funded. Um, Arlington Center and then East Arlington, and those would be funded by the earmark grant portion of the grant as a gift from the Chamber of Commerce. Um, and in, a, in the future, this doesn't preclude any additional wayfinding signage that could go in under the same design. Um, and so I know like one of the recommendations of the Miniman Bikeway Planning Study was to do, to improve the connection at Ryder Street. And that would help to, we could have wayfinding signs there in the same style and design that would connect people to that Brattle Square business district. Um, overall, the sign types, um, just really the identity signs are really for people who are passing by. So imagine you're in a car on Lake Street and you're passing by the Miniman Bikeway. It's really to announce that, hey, there is the bikeway here. Um, the kiosks are really what are connecting people on the bikeway to the business districts. And that's where we'll have maps. Um, we're not going to advertise any individual businesses. These are just going to have icons for types of businesses, so restaurants, theaters, et cetera. Um, we, we don't allow advertising on the bikeway, and this would be consistent with that. Um, the directional signs are as you're getting a little bit closer to an intersection. They're kind of like, um, you know, turn left for this, turn right for that, or continue straight to get to Lexington. Um, and the directional two signs are a little bit further out even from those intersections. It's sort of like um, a rest stop coming in two miles, that sort of thing. Um, the other thing that we're looking at is pointers, and those the only locations that those would be would be probably in the uh, Russell Common parking lot to really direct people both to the Arlington Center Business District and then to connect people to the bikeway because people do go and park there and then get on the bikeway for the day. So this is another way to do that. And then we're developing a series of sort of MUTCD consistent signs that could go on Mass Ave, and those would be to help redirect people back to the bikeway. In the packet that you have, um, we can go on to the next slide, but there's just little icons for each of those locations. Um, so really looking at how do we drive people from that Lake Street intersection out to the East Arlington Business District and back. Um, and this is just the assortment of signs that we're looking at. Same with Arlington Center, probably the most signage is here. And so this is, again, significant thanks to the Chamber of Commerce that we're able to even consider doing this. Um, the one thing I do want to note is in all three of those, these locations, we're also looking at quite a bit of cleanup. So there's a lot of remnant signs from different like iterations of bikeway signage at one point or another. So this is really trying to remove some of that, clean up some of the root areas, uh, especially in Arlington Heights, and start to think about how we can um, just have a cons consistent, cohesive signage. Um, and again, as I mentioned, this is all grant funded or funded through the earmark. Um, we have already talked with DPW with Mike Rodebacher, and he's agreed, agreed that his team would install this um, and also help with the cleanup. The funding includes design and fabrication. Um, and this is, again, the, the signage for Arlington Center and East Arlington is contingent on the select board um, approving the receipt of this as a gift. Um, and then this is just our more recent project. So obviously it's been going on since 2020, 2021. Um, more recently, this is where we are tonight, is with the presentation of the select board. We have presented this to the Arlington Chamber of Commerce, um, which I think Beth could comment on how they received it. They seemed very enthusiastic. Um, and then going forward, Jeff has been approved to go into fabrication. Um, and then the signs would be installed, delivered and installed at some point this summer. 
And so with that, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much. I will now turn to my colleagues. Mr. Hurd. Well, there's nothing like we like doing more than accepting gifts, so <laughs> I'll move approval of that. Um, this looks awesome. I mean, I, I think it's, there's definitely a need for it. Arlington is kind of the little brother, little sister to our neighboring towns on the Minuteman Bike Way. And as we transition into our 2025 big celebration, I think the, the bike way is going to be an important way that people connect the, the, the towns and to support the businesses in this way will be great. So I look forward to it. You can twist my arm to second that. You know? <laughs> so it's like, it's like and, and, and thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Lott, you know, for, for providing the funds to, to you know, include um, the center and, and, and East Arlington. You know. uh, and and uh, thanks to Ali, you know, I, I participated in some of the forums I mean, for the LRRP. You know, and and uh, it was a really good experience you know, uh, with working with the folks from Lexington and Bedford. And you know, they generated an awesome report. I mean, it's 228 pages of just really good information. You get to see what other people are doing around around the country. It's on the website. You know, uh, and uh, I encourage people to, to check it out. You know, and, and so, um, yeah, good work, good job. And once again, thank you so much. You know. Mr. Yes, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, and th thank you, Ms. Lyons, for the presentation and, and for the funding uh, for, from, the, from, from the chamber, uh, Ms. Locke. And, and I think it's, it's great to have the uniformity because I know on Lake Street, for example, the Capital Square Business Association does, had some signs there, and, and it, it would be great, it will be great to, to, to have that uniformity and, and perhaps have some potential locations, new locations. And, and you're absolutely right about being up the heights. You, you have no idea when you're when you're going on, on under the bridge. And I also want to thank you for, for your service uh, oh. to, 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 to the town and everything that you did while you're here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, about three days after I was elected to the select board a little more than two years ago, I was summoned to Arlington Center by Ted Beluso and Bob Radosha. And they sat me down at the, at the tourism kiosk and they said, people on the bikeway don't know there's businesses here. We want them to stop and shop, and here we are. So this is just terrific. Uh, I hope they're listening. <laughs> One question I have is, uh, what's the, approximately the value, the amount of, of the uh, donation that we're accepting? We're talking about, what, like 60 to 80,000. Yeah. R roughly, uh, roughly 60 to 80,000. It depends yeah. on the cost of material. So that's going out to bid right now. So we'll have more of a detail on that in about a week. Yeah, well, that's fine. And then just that's just for the public in information and to mm -hmm. increase our appreciation uh, <laughs> for this. That's terrific. Okay, any other discussion? So, um, and I must say, too, thank you, Ms. Lanema, for, for coming back. It just shows you that you're here on your own time after, after uh, departing the town for, for an exciting new opportunity, how dedicated you are to this community, and we're dedicated right back to you back. You leave this town uh, it, it improved in so many ways, and we are grateful. Uh, a motion uh, by Mr. Hurd and seconded by Mr. Diggins. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Chairman, yes, sir. If I could, um, if I could just through you let ACMI know I'm, I'm getting, and I apologize to Miss Line Emma Kelly for looking at my phone three times, but I'm getting texts for people at home that uh, there is no sound mm. of the select board meetings on their TV, and a few are having problems uh, connecting onto Zoom, which I, I can walk them through that. So, since I know ACMI is listening, thank you. Uh, that's that's good to know. Um, is Mara, are you, do you have any way, a way of, are you in contact with the control room? Anymore? I can send a message to ACMI and let them know through. Yeah, yeah. they should be able to hear me. And now I just said that, and I'm, I just got a text that just came back on. Oh, well, you have okay. magical power. Sorry about on. that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Boy, <laughs> ACMI is good. <laughs> yes, well, they, that is undoubtedly true. So. <laughs> that's like my theory. Better. Must have been a switch. <laughs> that's right. Um, I'm going to take a next item out of order in consideration for uh, a department head who's here uh, after a very long day of work. Mr. Champ is here to talk about the short-term rentals um, item 11. So let's move to that, and then we'll go back to the um, public hearings in the open forum. 
Uh, Mr. Champa, if you want to come up and um, introduce yourself. And we had a conversation earlier today. So in the select board packets and in the agenda is a number, a bunch of information, um, about a several, a series of, of act, complaints and actions about um, the property in 350 Washington Street. And my understanding after talking with Mr. Champa today is that there's not a specific action that we need to vote on or do tonight. We have an obligation to hear the latest um, complaint, but I think there's, there is some more up-to-date information. And uh, Mr. Champa very kindly offered to extend his work day uh, to come talk to us about that and, uh, and kind of give us some context about the issue of short-term short rentals for the board's uh, sure. discussion. And I think that this will probably be the first of, of additional discussions that we should have in the coming months to, to, to look at this issue as we, with something, a program we've recently implemented and, and may have some learning to do on the ground. So, Mr. Champ, I'll hand it over to you. If you just introduce yourself, please. Uh, Mike Champ, uh, Director of Infectional Services. Um, so, uh, our original concern uh, regarding short term rentals uh, revolved mostly around um, the ability for them to operate. Uh, without the required approvals and the difficulty in identifying them because as it was pointed out to me today in a perfect world, um, they shouldn't be able to be identified. They, they're in a residential district and they're supposed to mirror the everyday world that's existing there um, on a daily basis. Um, I think that um, what we're finding is that the short-term rentals, uh, I believe there's only four that are approved currently, and uh, the, so we, we were unable to substantiate the violations that had been um, that were a concern of residents. But what we're finding is that there, our inability to to know uh, to identify short-term rentals and um, the ease of them to operate without approval. Uh, is a concern of ours. And additionally, the building code currently does not cover short-term rentals, but there is additional, uh, the 10th edition of the building code is coming out in the fall, and that will uh, define and create regulations for short-term rentals that will give us a little more, um, a little more ability to enforce and some additional requirements that are, are not on the books currently, such as um, automatic sprinkler systems, egress path signage, annual inspections, um, and, and uh, some other regulations most likely. Uh, we've only been presented with the draft, but the final addition is supposed to be in effect uh, sometime in the fall. Um, I, uh, I'm, I'm not sure which, um, what else we would want to. Is there anything, uh, thank, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I think that's some good context. Is there anything specifically you'd want us to know about this particular complaint that came in um, or any history of this, of this property? So originally, the, um, the, the original concern was uh, reported from a resident and he was operating a short-term rental but had not re received the required approvals as of yet. And he um, obtained those approvals and most recently uh, we received a uh, concern from a resident that um, there were business operations happening out of the short-term rental and uh, upon inspection uh, we found a film crew uh, filming within the property um, and they admittedly said that you know they were filming for a client so it was um, it was a commercial use that's not uh, a commercial use other than the short-term rental that's not allowed in a residential district, um, even with the allowance of that they had for the rental. So um, the property was vacated because of that, and um, that was the only violation that, that was in existence at that time. Thank you. Uh, one, uh, one question I might have for Attorney Heim is if there's anything that you would like to add and for the board's consideration with regard to any action you suggest that we take tonight. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Our short-term rental bylaws permits but doesn't require any violations of uh, the myriad codes and regulations that govern short-term rentals as well as other things. 
it, it permits, it doesn't require those complaints to be heard by the board. So um, most of the complaints, to my understanding, have not been filed directly with the board. But they don't have to be filed directly with the board unless the uh, complaint is really about the bylaw itself rather than some of these underlying sort of zoning or health regulations. Uh, there are a number of uh, layers built in to both the uh, short-term rental uh, bylaw as well as the sort of general laws. One thing that I just want to state for public information and for folks who own short-term rental or are employing short-term rentals with their property is that it's not just important to register it with the town of Arlington, it's important to register with the state because the state collects an excise tax and you don't want to um, not be paying taxes to the state on a business that you're operating. So uh, a friendly word to folks operating short-term rentals, this isn't just a matter of the town and the town's bylaws and making sure that um, we uh, regulate these properties, which is obviously all of our main concern. But it's also important to register short-term rentals uh, on the state's registry um, for the tax purpose, which also benefits the, the town of Arlington um, in terms of part of that fee going to us. So um, I think the legal department is happy to look at our uh, bylaw as well as our application process to see what we can do to uh, help the inspectional services and other departments um, you know, scrutinize or get more of these um, short-term rentals in compliance. Uh, but, but, but absent that, I don't think there's anything specific that the board needs to do tonight. Thank you. Uh, Missy, um, I, this is, I think Mr. Hurd had his hand up first. I just had a comment as you were talking about this, like the idea of how you're going to, the insurmountable task of enforcing these, like how can you prove you get a complaint, you show up to somebody at someone's house, you have to stay there all night to make, see if they sleep over. <laughs> it's like, like how can you, like you, oh, I you, you, you prove up for that somebody that. is <laughs> renting their house, sure, like I guess you could see them online, but like, I like these are visitors, like what are you talking about? <laughs> So I don't envy your position in, in trying to enforce this. So hopefully there's something we can come up with that, that gives you the tools you need to I can or actually, write a law that is enforceable. <laughs> so. I can actually speak to that a little bit. Um, so you did stake out a house? <laughs> it, no, I did not. Um, not recently. Um, so it, it seems like it, it, that it's more common for them to register with the state under the, on the uh, public lodging registration um, than to register with the town itself. So um, the, there's a large number of, uh, of listings in, in order for them to operate on like Airbnb or, or um, any of those, any of the websites that would, that would bring the, the guests to them, they need to be registered with the state. Um, so we, we don't have any stakeouts planned in the future. <laughs> Mrs. Mahad, did you? No, no. You know what? I was I was actually giggling to myself, and I was trying to hide my face. But <laughs> it wasn't really a wave. Sorry. Fair enough, fair enough. But you're very good, eagle eye. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you, Mr. Champa. I, um, I think this is a good discussion for the awareness of the board. I think of the legal department. Um, so we, we don't need to do it specific uh, tonight. I know that the complaint that was received is already on your radar. You'll be keeping an eye on this property and any other properties that. You know that that uh, for which we have a complaint. So thank you, thank you for staying tonight. So thank you. Have a good trip home. Right. Okay, now we'll go back to uh, normal order of the public hearing. So item ten, the village lane betterments. This is a request to repair private ways, and we have an accompanying betterment order uh, for the uninitiated. I envy you. Uh, for those of us who live on private ways, we know all too well what, the, what this is. But if you live in a private way in town, which is something like 20% of the frontage of streets, we have to pay occasionally for the upkeep of our own town, and a, uh, of our own roads. And there is a um, process in place that you are about to witness. So we have Mr. Timothy McCann uh, before us, I think, to speak with the board. Mr. McCann, if you are uh, here, you can... Unmute yourself. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Hi. All right. Can you, can you, you see are. me? Yes, we can hear and see you. Thank you very much. Oh, so uh, if you just fantastic. give us a brief summary of, of uh, what you're asking us to approve, and then we'll uh, give neighbors, any neighbors here an opportunity 
uh, to, to talk. And I would say if there are members of the public here who are here to participate and provide comment for this hearing, you can go ahead and raise your hand and Zoom now, and we'll note that for uh, after Mr. McCann finishes speaking. So, yes, sir. Please proceed. Sure. So I guess just a 30,000-foot uh, overview of the Village Lane Betterment Project. Um, we have a private road uh, that intersects Lake Street on two different areas. There are a total of eight abutters. Uh, the road ranges anywhere from uh, 24 to 26 feet, uh, and it's in terrible, terrible condition. Um, we needed to replace it, I guess, 15, 20 years ago. Um, I moved in uh, to, uh, to this area in December of 2019, and, and the neighbors were already talking about how badly they needed it uh, to be replaced. So finally, um, they all uh, voted me as the lead, and uh, so I started doing the research. Um, first, one of the first things I did was uh, reach out um, you know, to you guys and uh, engineering uh, Vince Kilcommons. Uh, who's been like fantastic in terms of site visits and helping us map out all the requirements that we need. So long and short, um, the only major issue we have with this project is that we need uh, two leaching basins uh, to catch the uh, runoff. Uh, other than that, it's a pretty simple, straightforward, uh, two inches of binder, two inches of top coat, uh, along with excavating and um, removing existing cobblestones from the road. Uh, and that was the uh, quote that we had, uh, we actually had um, uh, looked at a number of contractors to do the work. And uh, we selected one and then submitted that in, uh, that estimate to, uh, uh, to the select board. And I guess this is the next step in the process. So uh, this is a project we've, we've been working on since last July. Um, and so we're actually quite excited now to, you know, get this over the goal line. And uh, so I'm here to answer any questions you guys may have. Thank you. Um, before we turn to members of the public, is there any members of the board who have questions or comments? I see one hand raised, um, uh, Ms. Rice Hansen. So Ms. Mar, Ms. Mar can promote this person to panelist, and then uh, you'll be able to unmute yourself and, and address the board. Hi. Is um, Go right ahead. Rel related to the betterment or moving on to the... This is relating to the betterment, yes. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I thought you were having us raise our hand related to the... Oh, sorry. to the open floor? Well, you, you're, yeah. you're nearly on time, so why don't you just hang out there and we'll, we'll get right to you. Okay, I'll um, mute myself. Th thank you very much. Um, all right, so I don't see anybody online. Do, do you agree, Ms. Mar? No, that was, that was it. Okay, for the betterment. Okay, so uh, any questions? I guess I'll entertain a motion. Mr. DeCourcy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I'll, I'll move to approve the request to repair the private way and uh, move approval of the betterment order that's uh, attached to our agenda. Second. Oh. I think I had a microsecond earlier for Mr. Hurd. Okay, any other discussion? On a motion for approval of both items by Mr. DeCourcy and seconded by Mr. Hurd. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? It is unanimous. Thank you for your work for your neighborhood, Mr. McCann. You're all Thank set. you very much. Thank you. Have a good evening. All right, good evening. All right, let's move on to open forum. And I'm going to bring up my trusty iPhone timer. All right. So, except in unusual circumstances, any matter presented for consideration of the board shall neither be acted upon nor a decision made uh, the night of the presentation in accordance with the policy under which the open forum was established. It should be noted that there is a three-minute time limit to present a concern or a request. Uh, gotcha. And anybody in the room who wants to, wants to speak, we'll, we'll, we'll get to you. So thank you. Um, so what I'll do is, if there's anybody else in Zoom land who wants to speak on any matter on open forum within three minutes, please raise your hand in Zoom and we'll get to you. We have um, Catherine ready for us to go. So I'll start with Zoom and then I'll, if there are others in Zoom, I'll just alternate back and forth. Uh, so uh, Catherine, go right ahead. Thank you. 
my name is Catherine Lisa Hansen. Uh, I live at 30 Bradley Road, and which is in Precinct 11. My daughter is more at Minuteman High School, majoring in electrical wiring. And I am speaking tonight in advance of your discussion about the reappointment policy for the Minuteman School Committee. I encourage you to expand that topic to also allow for the appointment of a new Minuteman School Committee representative for Arlington. I appreciate that our current representative, Mr. Rutterman, has no doubt worked hard, honestly, and with personal sacrifice to guide Minuteman during his term. Over our family's two years at Minuteman, and especially the past month, I have been very disappointed that he has not proactively shared information, his views, and solicited feedback in an open forum format from his constituents, the Minuteman families from Arlington. I'll limit my reasons for my concern since I realize that Mr. Rutterman's reappointment is not the focus this evening, but it has raised the question of what the select board's policy is regarding reappointments. I respectfully request that you implement a public application process. That the process begin with a call for self nominations, including from the current representative if he or she wishes to continue in the role. Please include in the policy that students, parents, and guardians of current and recently accepted students at Minimum will be notified of the call for nominations. After the nomination deadline, then publicly announce the names and invite the public to submit letters in support or expressing concern to the select board. Again, the current Minuteman community should be directly notified. I am sure Minuteman can assist in distributing these emails. I also encourage you to give priority consideration to candidates who have a connection to Minuteman, of course, parents, alumni, co-op employers, etc as well as teachers or administrators at other vocational technical high schools. On May 21st, I emailed you a more detailed request for this process. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, we have someone from the room. Come on up and uh, please just introduce yourself. Step up to the microphone. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm Sarah Montague. I'm a 25-year resident of Arlington. I live at 19 Rockmont Road. I'm also the very proud parent of a senior at Minuteman High School, and we thank you for acknowledging the letters that we have sent to the, to the group. And um, I would just like to reiterate, we'd very much like to be involved in the process for how you determine what the next steps are. We feel very strongly that Mr. Ruderman should not be reappointed. And I think that we have shared the details as, as to why, um, and the details have also been publicly documented in the media as well. So I thank you for your time, and there are other parents and guardians here in the room. And while I speak for myself personally, we would very much like to be involved and participate in the process. Thank you. Thank you very much. I do not see any other hands raised in Zoom. Um, additional members of the audience? Welcome. Hi, good evening. Michelle Orfanos, town meeting member, Precinct 13. I would like to go on record in joining the growing number of concerned parents and Arlington citizens that is requesting this board replace and not reappoint Michael Ruderman to school committee. Thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> Any other members of the public? I see um, one hand raised in Zoom. Thank, thank you. Uh, go ahead. Be, I'll be promoting them now. Yep, yeah, we'll be promoting Sylvia Stevens to speak. Take the village. And Village Lane getting repaved. The Meister's Lane. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, Good evening. We can see and hear you. Go right ahead. Mm -hmm. Thank you. My name is Libby Stevens. I am a long-term resident of Arlington. Uh, I live at 89 Barnum Street, and I'm just uh, joining those in um, Zoom and also in person of showing concerns about the process for 
the school committee uh, representation for Minuteman High School. Um, I would hope that moving forward, candidates would be connected to Minuteman in some way, as was recommended, but also that the general community gets to know more about them and has more of a communicative process with them. Uh, right now, um, there's a lot of concerns happening at Minuteman, and this isn't the forum to discuss them, but uh, I've been concerned that our representative hasn't been forthright in communication with the greater community, um, and we hope that moving forward um, that could be corrected. Thank you. Anybody else in Zoom or otherwise? Sure, come on up. Just state your name for the record, please. Um, I'm Gina, Gina Carmi. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Um, I just want to echo the sad sentiments of the other parents. I'm also a Minuteman parent and um, would like to be involved in the process of the next, or the process for um, finding the next school committee rep. Thank you. Thanks for your time. Thank you. for open forum we good miss mark no hands raised yes okay that concludes open forum thank you very much for your interest and for speaking up all right so uh we've already addressed item 11 out of turn so we'll now move to item 12 discussion and proposed vote about double polls by mr de Corsi. Thank, thank you mr chairman and I'm, I'm back before the board a little earlier than i first anticipated but I had brought this issue up most recently at our meeting on May 8th, and at that time I indicated uh, my concern with the poll on, on uh, at the corner of Mass Ave and Adams Street, but I also indicated that Verizon would be submitting their semi-annual double poll report to the state shortly. Well, it turned out they submitted that on May 15th, and, and so what I'd like to do is go through a little bit of history briefly, some proposed actions, and just an update where we are in double polls. Um, the presentation, a brief PowerPoint presentation, it is now attached to the Novus agenda. I got that late to, to Ms. Mar today, so I apologize to the, my fellow members. Um, but if we could go back actually to the first page. This is the poll that I bring up every six months or so at the corner of Adams uh, and Mass Ave. And I had mentioned the rope at the top of the old poll, which you can see at the very at the top of the old poll, about two almost two-thirds of the way up the new poll is being circled now on, on the screen. That's how it's being secured at the top of, of the poll. So if we go to the next slide, just for the public's benefit and for the board, the statutory reference for the replacement of public polls is in Chapter 164, Section 34B, and that provides that once a new poll is put in place, the old poll shall be removed within 90 days of the installation of the new poll. This statute was passed in 1997 with the Electric, Utility, Electric Industry Restructuring Act. Um, next slide. Here is a trip down memory lane. Um, that's me <laughs> on the right side of the screen there on October 25th, 2021 uh, on one of our Zoom meetings pointing out the problem with the poll on Mass Ave and Adam Street. Actually, if you can go back up uh, again. At that time, there was a hearing for Eversource and Ms. Duffy, who is Eversource's representative, um, said that she would forward the picture and forward a request to Verizon the next day, which she did. Mm -hmm. um, it is Verizon's responsibility in Arlington to coordinate the replacement of double poles. They have to coordinate with the cable companies and with the electric company. Uh, Ms. Duffy got in touch with Verizon. ACMI had a story two weeks later where they reached out to Verizon. Verizon basically said it's everybody else's fault. We're waiting for them to replace their lines. Uh, Mr. Chapdelaine had reached out to, at that time in, in, in 2021, um, didn't receive a response. Um, I brought this up again. If I go to the next slide, uh, Mr. Pooler was at a meeting in November at a select board meeting where I asked him to reach out to Verizon. He did that that very week. And uh, Stan, you will see, is the government affairs person for Verizon, um, Mr. Pooler asked him in that email for any update on the Mass Ave Adams Street uh, poll. I think at that point he was told a similar story that we're waiting for coordination. Fast forward to the next screen on May 9th, um, 
in, in following a further call from Mr. Pooler to Mr. Yusevitz, who is the government affairs specialist, uh, we received a response in writing stating that the poll isn't even listed on their double poll database um, and that he would send it to Verizon Operations. Um, next slide, Mr. Pooler got back to him that day, May 9th, saying it's unacceptable, it's not a good answer. The issue's been going on for more than two years. Um, if we continue, um, so, th so that's where we are in terms of, we have a history here of reaching out to Verizon, being told that it's the cable companies or the electric company's fault, and they're waiting. I actually had a conversation earlier today with Mr. Jack Hurd, who had worked on this issue previously uh, when he was on the board, and mm -hmm. without even telling him what these answers were today, he said, we were told they're waiting for the other parties to do something. So here we are. Um, I'm just saying from the point I first brought it up in October 2021, we still don't have that, po that poll uh, fixed. This is an excerpt from the report that was filed on May 15th, um, double poll report through April 30th, 2023. And per Verizon, there's 78 double polls in Arlington, 66 are more than three years old. So you compare that to the 90-day requirement. None are less than 90 days old. Now, there is some progress. Back in 2020, there was 131 double polls, but I will tell the board that um, I, I doubt the completeness of the double poll report because, as we said, the, the one on Adams Street isn't on the list. They only list two on Mass Ave. There are others in town mm -hmm. where I know there are multiple polls on streets and they're not listed. So I have a series of proposed recommendations to the board for potential vote and discussion and um, have one per page. Um, so the first one is to authorize the town man manager and, and I think also include the uh, town council in terms of maybe some of the statutory references as, as well to send a letter to Verizon demanding the coordination with other licensees for the re prompt replacement of double poles on Adams Street and I listed one at 108 Warren Street. That is one that I brought up in October 2021. That is a double pole that doesn't even allow you to pass by on the sidewalk. If, if, if you had um, someone, um, there's barely enough room, there's a bolt hanging out of the second pole that if you were walking by it at night, you might even walk into it. Um, the pole is completely overloaded. It needs to be changed. It's been far too long. Um, that's the first part of the action. Second part is to seek Verizon's commitment to conduct a full audit of its double poll in inventory, update the list for its next report for the period ending November 30th, 2023. Um, I will say if that doesn't happen, I will bring a motion before the board for us to intervene in the, um, uh, the, the docket filing with the DTE uh, that takes place by the utility companies. This, this happens every six months. And um, let's see how they respond to this, because if they don't, I think it's time for us to let the state know what we've done and the lack of uh, cooperation that we're getting. Uh, next one, seek Verizon's commitment to meet with the town quarterly to review double, the double poll list and to hear the steps that Verizon will take. This is the, the progress that we've been talking about that we're seeking from them. Um, and again, had we received responsive answers, had we had them check the double poll inventory two years ago and added this poll to the list. I don't think this would be necessary, but just not getting cooperation. Um, number four is to request that Verizon provide details on specific steps it has taken to notify other licensees um, and coordinate timely removal. This was actually a requirement back in 2003 when this list requirement was created that the utility companies in their particular community were to document what they've done to coordinate and kind of fell off um, the reporting. I think it needs to be put back in because if there are other licensees that are holding things up, we can look at their licenses and, and, and make that a, a condition. Um, one last thing I will say, and I don't have this as a suggested vote, and I'd ask Attorney Heim maybe to follow up with the board, is that there is 5G licenses that the town has granted to Verizon and my understanding is that they are not allowed to put any new equipment on double poles. And driving home today, 
I happened, and didn't have to look too hard, um, to see 5G equipment on a double pole in front of Arlington Eats. So if that is the case, uh, that that equipment is there, I think we should notify them as well that um, they either replace that pole or remove the equipment. So those are the recommendations, and, and um, I'm um, happy to try to answer any questions and uh, you know, ask for your support on that. Thank you, Mr. Corsi. Before we go to the board, I wanted to check in with our town manager, see if you had anything to add, and appreciate your uh, the, tra the documentation of your fierce emails um, and, and track record. But uh, anything else you wanted the board to consider? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, there had I know one of the utilities did move uh, some of their equipment at the Mass Ave and Adams Street um, location, um, but in the correspondence I've gotten back and forth, I don't. I was not told which one, so I know there's been some movement, but there needs to be more. I think the level of communication has been just horrendous, so I agree with everything that Mr. DeCourcy said. I'd be more than happy to follow up sending a letter and following up to try to get some uh, more specific and direct communication from Verizon and from the other utilities in town so that we can move forward and make progress with these polls. Discussion, motions? Can I second Mr. DeCourcy's motion um, for the, was it four action steps yes. that you've outlined right now? And then if we go beyond that, um, and I do, uh, I mean, bless the residents of town that reelect me, but Mr. Jacker did, uh, uh, one of his ballywicks was the double pole issue, and he definitely hit the ground running, and we started to get some progress on that. Um, and there was a lot of work, a lot of, uh, I won't even say doubling back as the town manager's done, because I think you've done at least triple, <laughs> if not quadruple back. Um, and um, I think this is a good continuation of that. I'm sure we can't use Mr. Jack Hurd's efforts to demonstrate how long. If we can, I'd like to. But, um, and, and I like what Mr. DeCourcy has outlined, and if um, it can be, uh, through the uh, manager and town council and or deputy town council memorialize more, um, not just uh, to have something on paper or digital, but also to have something that is a continue, continuous reporting to and reporting from vehicle so that this is something um, we can stay on top of so that we don't keep getting the, it's the other utilities that, um, that we're waiting for because I know I remember that meeting in, <clears throat> I think, October of 21, when Mr. DeCourcy was chair and, and uh, Jackie Duffy from Eversource really got right, right back to us right away. And my memory may be faulty, but um, I did not hear any um, delay or anything on, on behalf of Eversource. So I want to thank um, Mr. DeCourcy for picking this up and for, bless you, finding polls, double polls with, is it 5G you said? Yes. I'm going to Google that and then try to see if I can find some myself. Um, maybe the high school seniors will put that on their scavenger list, but no, we won't do that. But thank you. And I do appreciate this, and, and I appreciate the fact that I think what we're doing um, and what I'm hearing is that uh, we're going to implement a process so this and any future board going forward will have that in place, and it will just be a matter of the chair or a future chair doing uh, whatever the then board agrees upon, whether it's a, a biannual or quarterly report on this issue. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Attorney Hyman raised his hand. Did you, did you want to go before we head for the support discussion, Mr. Hyman? Go right ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to clarify one point. Um, when we're talking about 5G, what we're talking about is the town doesn't currently um, lease any of its colts. What the town does is provide what's called a small wireless facility permit. One of the conditions of those small wireless facility permits is explicitly that small uh, wireless uh, facility, which is basically the 5G that Mr. DeCourcy and Ms. Simon are referencing, cannot be placed in double poles. So these poles are all owned by Verizon, Eversource, et cetera. Uh, they're not the town's poles, but the town is, uh, does have a limited role in permitting them. And one of the things that we're allowed to do is say, you can't put them on double poles. You can't put them in front of historic resources. Thank you. Mr. Hurd. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was going to say I was very impressed that you 
are able to identify 5G equipment. I don't even know what that is. But um, it's a testament to your level of detail in this. Um, thank you for the work. Happy to support everything. I know this is a, the issue that never ends. And I do hear from it from time to time from a for former select board member at baseball <laughs> games and family events about the irritation to dealing with double poles. Um, so it's good to get movement and the squeaky wheel gets the grease. So I think we're moving in the right direction. Again, thank you for the work here. And Mr. Town Manager, I assume you can get all these polls resolved before you retire. <laughs> so. <In> two months. <laughs> thank you. So, um, do you, Mr. Um, what's, the, what's the scale of the problem? I mean, does this, is this going on across the state? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, um, no, this is a problem. If you Google double polls, yeah. um, you will see it from time to time in a number of different communities. And it, over time, there's been, there, there was this tension where a lot of communities wanted to impose fines um, at the local level and that the town of Bedford actually brought a case all the way up to the SJC. They're unsuccessful because of the, the state regulation, but Lexington has had issues, Wayland has had issues. Um, <coughs> number of cases, I was talking to someone who used to be on the board of selectmen in, in Norwood, and um, they institute a similar thing, basically said, don't come before us unless it's an emergency, unless you're going to give us an update on double polls. Just trying to, I mean, so the, let's say all these four steps don't work. What next? Yeah, okay. So and I'm only one person, Ty, so I think what next is what I said about intervening in, in the semi-annual reports. There is, and I didn't want to get into a vote on potential legislation, especially with the chair still part of the discussion <laughs> here, but there, there is legislation pending that, that uh, gets filed every two years. It really hasn't gone anywhere that provides fines right. if the time limits aren't, aren't met. And it's not after 90 days, it's after 180 days, it's after 270 days. And I believe it's a representative from Quincy who's filed that bill. I think at that point we uh, maybe take steps to encourage our local delegation to get behind that. Yeah. And um, it, because one of the problems that we've said with this statute is there's no provision there um, if, if there's not compliance with the statute. So, right. I mean, I think if we document this, see what we've done, look for feedback, yeah. look for cooperation, if we don't get it, then I think we push <laughs> the penalty route. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I, 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 I agree with that. I mean, so, so, so yes, let's try this. I mean, let's be prepared for the fact we're likely it's not going to result in anything, you know, substantial. You know, I, love that I turn out to be wrong on that, you know, but then, you know, let's find out I mean, what the levers are I mean, on, on the state side I mean, to try and get something to happen. And I'll stop talking because of my colleague's role, you know, but okay, I, I, okay, you'll let me know when I shouldn't say anything regarding, you know, because of your position. And then, um, so yeah, I mean, so as, as I've said repeatedly on other issues, it's like you need to find out I mean, why things aren't moving on the state level I mean, and, and then I mean, try and get whatever is blocking that change, I mean, um, I mean, to not be a blockage uh, anymore. And that's fine. <laughs> people you know, have conversations with. So, so I'm happy to help out as much as I can, but certainly support this and then prepare for, for the next step be in the next cycle, as opposed to getting to the next cycle and then going, we missed it. Because as you know, you have a very small period. Yeah, okay, so I'll, keep talk I'll stop talking. Yeah, Thank yeah, you. Yeah. 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 But I mean, once you're shaking your head, you know what I'm saying. I'll f I feel as if I don't need to keep saying it. I mean, just to occupy time. I mean, so, all right, thanks. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Biggins, sir. Any other further discussion? It's my understanding that it's the Senate Chiefs of Staff that are causing all the delays in the legislation. <laughs> I, that's just what so, someone told me. Terrible, terrible rumor. <laughs> I will, I will say that I would happily recuse myself should the, for this issue and the other should the, should the need arise. But it, it's fine, you know, in terms of my potential conflict of interest, it's fine for the, the it to be talked about in the abstract. I can't participate or, or vote um, okay. on such a thing. So, right. yeah. Mrs. Mahan. <clears throat> and please, anyone correct me if I'm wrong in, in uh, response to my colleague, Mr. Diggins' uh, question. Um, one of the other things we can do when I first got on the board with the previous Mr. Hurd and my other colleagues was 
um, we could take uh, Verizon's request, similar to what Norwood is doing, or, or had, had done. done, had done. Uh, the, the then board had a sort of version of that. Um, we could take uh, Verizon's request as they come in and then let them know. Um, and, and this is something I'm not advocating pro or con for tonight. Um, because, but we can go back to that step to say, unless it's for emergency purposes, but then we also have to, if that's a step we want to do, we need to discuss it to say what we are saying no to, are we penalizing uh, individual resident or residents because of Verizon's apparent uh, lack of, of response. So that's another step, but that's like a really severe, um, but I think perhaps, um, I know, because uh, serving on the board previously is when this came up, when the board does have serious discussions around that, um, I, I am confident it's something that um, the officials at, at Verizon sort of take note of, so, but thank you, Mr. Chair. I think we uh, have our new patron saint of double poles here, my colleague, Mr. DeCourcy. Okay, uh, so we have a motion from Mr. DeCourcy and seconded by Mrs. Mahan. All in favor? Say aye. aye. Opposed? A unanimous vote. Thank you for your efforts, Mr. DeCourcy. Item 13, discussion of reappointment policy for Minuteman School Committee and other direct select board appointments. So I added this to the agenda because as a function of timing, the current uh, term for the current representative to the Minuteman School Committee ends on June 30th. And as a function of history, the select board only as of 2019 be, became the appointing authority for this particular body. Up until that point, it had been the town moderator, but the new original agreement which governs the, the, how, how the, uh, the board is appointed changed and at that time we had one year left on the term of the previous representative, uh, Ms. Scheffler. She indicated that she did not want to, to serve. So at that point in 2020, uh, Mr. Ruderman, our current representative, was appointed by this body. So we now find ourselves for the first time as the select board being the appointing authority encountering a situation where what do we do when we have the, the expiration of a term uh, the incumbent has expressed a desire or willingness to be reappointed. And I thought it would be a good time to not only talk about and, and receive and seek guidance from my colleagues about how we should proceed with this particular appointment, but also to, to at least begin a discussion and to begin thinking about how we, we might want to approach certain other direct appointments that the board has. And most of the appointments that we do are, are made by the town manager and we simply confirm them um, but certain bodies like the Zoning Board of Appeals are direct appointments for this board. And I think that you know, it's an interesting discussion brought into focus perhaps by the timeliness of the Minuteman is, you know, what do we do with, particularly in my view, with, with bodies, boards, commissions, and committees that have significant authority in either making policy or in interpreting and applying policy. And um, you know, when we have a, a member that's finished their term, should our policy be for any particular body or, in, or any or all of them? Do we just, do we uh, allow ourselves the, the opportunity to just do a reappointment if the person wants to serve? Or would we, as a matter of, pr of common procedure, open this up to a public process or to or open up to public applications? Uh, so at this point, I think I'd encourage the board to focus the discussion tonight specifically on that question and what do we want to do with Minuteman and we can discuss other other direct uh, select board appointments. I want to offer my thanks to our town clerk and to our board administrator for uh, realizing today that this resonates uh, with one of the recommendations of the community equity audit which was um, and that's before uh, the board here to implement universal practices for commission and committee appointments and advertisements for upcoming and current open seats and I'm informed that when the equity audit was discussed in, in meetings of department heads, that reappointments came into focus too. And I think there's a lot to discuss there and, and I don't want to get outside the scope too much of, of the direct board select appointments, but I think that the select board direct appointments, but I think it's, it's worth noting that that's another consideration just to think about for particularly for the weightier 
more active boards with, with more responsibility, uh, what do we want to do? Do we want to have a policy? Do we want to take it case by case? I don't think there's any right or wrong answer. Uh, but that said, uh, so I welcome that discussion and I welcome guidance from the board. Um, I didn't put a vote on the agenda. I think that it's, uh, we can, if we, anyone wants to make a motion for that, we can check in with Attorney Heim to see if that would be in scope of the agenda item. Uh, but I don't think we need to do that now. I think I want to know what you all think. Thank you. Oh, well, yeah, I, mean, uh, I think we should have a policy. You know, and, and it will take some some effort, you know, uh, but I think it's effort well worth spent. You know, it'll take a lot of effort, you know, and uh, but I think it's, it's worth worth doing. And it's something that will take a while, perhaps, for us to, to um, implement. And, but and I would say uh, we can certainly let the, the Minuteman appointment be kick us off uh, on the process. You know, so that's my short start. Yeah, thank you. In turn. Thank you. And I just want to start by saying, I mean, we talk, we, me and Mr. Ding, and Mr. Helm, I'm doing it now. <laughs> we talk about agenda items as vice chair and chair to, to a point, and this certainly was not in any way related to the current representative on the Minuteman School Committee. Um, this is just a, something in general that I think some of us have talked, had thought about, and we do reappointments on the consent agenda, and they kind of just pass through from time to time. And we have a lot of boards and commissions, and many of our boards and commissions are actively seeking new members, and some are full, and some are generate a lot of interest. And like the chair said, some have pretty wide authority to make policy on behalf of the town, even some policies that might not reflect the wills and wants of the general public. So I think, you know, we should have a policy, certainly for Minuteman. I mean, school committee seat in general seems to me a no-brainer because I don't like the school committee, just like the select board, they have to run for the seat after three years. And I think whoever sits in that seat every three years should have to reapply and open up the opportunity for others to apply. Um, a number of residents came in today and talked about being involved in the process. I think if just by way of opening the process to nominations and having you know a public hearing about um, who we're going to pick and opening we have open forum, we have different ways to solicit public feedback for agenda items. That brings Minuteman parents into the process and brings Arlington school parents into the process. Whoever wants to participate can put their opinions into who gets chosen for that seat. And I think it's good for even if you're going to reappoint the same person every three years to have that process to to vet and make sure that the person is doing their job. And again, it is no reflection on Mr. Rudiman, who I think is a very staunch advocate for Minuteman. He always has been, and in my opinion, is doing a good job. But it just in general, for that position and for other boards and commissions, both direct select board appointments and some that aren't, I think it is important to make sure that we are putting the best people on these boards and commissions and the reason we have it's not a lifetime appointment like the Supreme Court is that really this board has a duty I think to make sure that the people that are serving on these boards and commissions are doing what they're supposed to and they're acting in a way that reflects the will of the residents of Arlington who elect us which is why this board is the body that does makes those confirmations. Um, so I guess Mr. Diggins gave the short answer. I, mine is the more long-winded answer of saying that I think we should have a policy both for this position and just in general. And it will cause some administrative burdens, we know. But like I said, for mo most of the positions, it 
I don't know how we differentiate one board or commission versus the other, which makes it difficult because last I checked, we had in the hundreds <laughs> of boards and commissions. But it also is a way to advertise <coughs> openings and serving on some of the boards that we liaise to we, for ATED. I think every agenda we have an agenda item, new recruitment. How do we get more people involved in ATED? And a, a process of posting positions that are open would help us do that. Um, so I am definitely on board with a policy and I think um, it will help us, again, have boards and commissions and representatives that closely reflect you know, the will of the Arlington residents. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this is one of the, this is the, probably the main thing I was playing phone and text tag with you on because um, <clears throat> first I would have a question either to you or to Attorney Heim, and then I'll briefly encapsulate my thoughts. But as the chairman pointed out, um, this is the really the first time since uh, the agreement was rewritten with the Minuteman communities and two or three towns that asked to uh, exit uh, the Minuteman family were allowed to do that. And another um, facet of that was the changing of the appointment from the town moderator um, to, for Arlington, the select board. Um, and in terms of establishing a policy, uh, I would ask the chair and or attorney Heim, just as a starting point, um, I think under that new agreement in place uh, regarding the Minuteman communities, there, w what steps, which I think is a step we've already taken, but what steps do we have to do per that agreement, which would be incorporated into our policy? So that would be my first short, short question. Uh, for Attorney Heim. If that's okay. Of course, yes. Uh, Attorney Heim, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The requirements for appointment are set forth in sections 1C and D of the agreement. They don't actually provide very much information other than to say that the select board is the appointing authority and that um, a reappointment needs to be made. There's no specific process. It does allow for us, if we wanted to, to by bylaw or by special legislation, return that responsibility to the moderator specifically. But other than that, it doesn't provide any detail for how you have to go about um, making your initial appointment or making any reappointment. Uh, I just want to take a second, if it's okay with um, uh, folks, to talk about uh, the fact that you're not totally starting from scratch. Minuteman is somewhat unique in the sense that you, in your handbook, um, I believe section five, it talks about your appointments under uh, your statutory authority and as well as your appointments under committees created by the select board. This is neither one of those things. But um, your sort of practice there is to welcome feedback, including uh, folks to submit candidates in writing um, and suggesting that they'd like to see this person appointed from interest groups, residents, et cetera. Um, and then for your reappointments, you've committed to contacting folks who are uh, up for reappointment, but there's not a lot of detail, which I think is part of what uh, the chair and all of you are here to discuss tonight to maybe see. Do you want to formalize sort of different steps in that more than you have in your current hand? Um, and furthermore, because Minuteman is a unique sort of entity, it isn't technically a appointment pursuant to your statutory authorities, nor is it uh, an appointment um, under some sort of committee that you've created, like a transportation advisory committee or something of that nature. So uh, there's a little bit of a long way of answering your question, Mrs. Mahan, which is that there really isn't anything uh, guiding us except for good practice, which is to say, you know, that the board should um, have the discussion that you're having now and decide what do we feel like we need to do to make sure that we've uh, made sure that we've seen appropriate candidates and uh, taken appropriate steps to vet them. Um, so the good news is, is that we have a lot of flexibility. The bad news is that with that flexibility, there isn't a ton of guidance for exactly what you have to do and what you should do. Thank you, Mr. Okay. And then um, I guess what I would say to that, and I, it may be a step, uh, maybe Ms. Marr, 
um, or Mr. Chairman, that we've already taken. Um, what I'd like to hear from, from my colleagues is I think part of that process in terms of uh, reaching out to the community, in this case the Minuteman community, um, would be, because uh, I believe the first time we contacted uh, the superintendent, um, and I always say his name wrong, Superintendent Boquillen? Boquillen. I apologize. Um, and I think this time we also have contacted the superintendent and or. That's correct. We've reached out to the superintendent's office. Although she's not there, the admin assistant has reached out to us. Okay. So uh, as of now. And we've, and we've also reached out to Mr. Ritterman, right? Yes, and he's expressed his interest. Right. So I think for for this particular appointment, and I guess I would suggest um, this is a good sort of starting point for, I think, our next meeting agenda when we set um, the June, July, and August, or July and August dates when we set our uh, mission and goals. Um, this should probably be where we really get into the meat of it, of what do we want to do, A, with appointments moving forward, um, keeping in mind the, the uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, equity report, B, what do we want to do at our goals meeting to Section 5 of the uh, Select Board Handbook and see anything else that the chair picks up on that I'm missing. But um, for this this particular appointment, um, uh, I like the steps that we've taken. It is something new. Um, I think whatever... Uh, outreach the chair with the select board office can do to advertise this and I think we should do this um, every three years because similar to I don't know if it was Mr. Hurd or, or Mr. Diggins about school committee every three years select board every three years um, I think we take each of the appointments that the select board has if we can lump them into two three four categories that's great but I think this really is sort of unique um, and I'd, and I would be interested in keeping it uh, per the most recent Minuteman agreement with the select board just of the sense of um, I think it opens up, opens up the opportunity to anyone in the Minuteman community, whether you're a parent or not, whether you're a professional, paraprofessional with Minuteman or a regional vocational technical school or not. And I think the select board allows that wide range sort of welcoming. Um, not that the town moderator doesn't, but when you hear it's a town meeting, town moderator appointment, it might go with the stigma, oh, well, I'm not a town meeting member. So um, I think we should keep it with the select board. Um, I think we should continue with the steps that the chair and the select board's office has taken, which is uh, the Minuteman community has been notified. Maybe the chair could follow up on to make sure what the proper vehicle is, whether there's a Minuteman universal list that this could be posted and then whatever we normally do in the regular course of business, um, as well as I think you've had the conversation with Mr. Ruderman, and I think we should do that going forward. And this appointment is every three years or every, four, every three years? Um, and then have the longer conversation on that. So I'm fine, fine with the course that the chair has set in the office in, in Turning Heim, and um, I'd like to keep the appointment with the select board, and I'd like to really redefine uh, Section 5 Select Board Handbook and um, under the generalities of the Minuteman Agreement, 1 C and D, uh, after that discussion, maybe sort of incorporate or beef that up and keep the appointment with us. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Mr. DeCourcy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with my colleagues, and, and I will say, uh, just to maybe stress, that, that the Minuteman appointment is unique because of, of that constituency of the, that the parents who are, are, are sending their children to Minuteman, and, and it's un, unlike any other appointment that we make in terms of um, over the years, previously it was the moderator's appointment, but I just know from my years on Finance Committee, um, didn't always know what was happening up at Miniman, depending on who was on on the school committee up there, who the who the representative was. But I think also keeping it as a select board appointment, 
Um, and we had talked about this briefly, but maybe receiving updates from the school committee member too in terms of what's going on because there are certainly issues regarding potential expansion of the district, potential capital expansion, and, and just issues in terms of um, the, the um, allocation of the, of the assessments to the, to the member of the community. So I, I, I think the course that has been set forth here, I, I, I agree with it as well. We receive feedback, and I think we should uh, continue um, to, to make the appointment. I'll say more after you. I mean, you haven't spoken yet, so if you want to speak, and then I can speak after you if you want to talk. It's up to you. Go right in there. Sure. Yeah. So, yeah, I, mean, I, I would say keep it as first as the moderator. Only other body I would I would say submitted to would be the school committee, you know, uh, since they have, I mean, they know schools probably better than we do, you know, uh, uh, but it would certainly be an avenue for us to maybe get some, some advice. I'm thinking, you know, if we want to really be vet more candidates, we might need to spin up being uh, a subcommittee being uh, to do some work between now and the end of July of June because it's not a whole lot of time, especially if we want to, you know, vet some more candidates in terms of policy. It's really going to come down to how we actually do the selection and the vetting process. I mean, do we have interviews? You know, I mean, once again, that might be something for a subcommittee of ours to do. You know, so you because we want to spend time um, with the candidates, I mean, you might have. I mean, let's say you, you, have, you put it out there and you get I mean, 20 candidates. I mean, how do you whittle that down I mean, to the number that you're going to interview? I mean, who interviews them and then makes the recommendation um, to the full board? I mean, do, do you do that interview in a public format? You know, uh, you know, do you have a debate? I mean, it's just things to think about. You know, and it may be a lot to think about for this cycle. We may do, do more in the next cycle, but I think we need to do a whole lot more than we did in the previous cycle. Granted, it was our first time, but, but um, there's certainly you know demand out there for more more input. And, and of course, we want to be very deliberative. We don't simply want to respond I mean, to a loud outcry. I mean, by that, I mean you want to be you, you want to listen to the loud outcry, but you don't want I mean, the direction of the outcry to determine what you do. You want to take that in as a factor and then use that in, her, in terms of helping you decide what you ultimately, you know, who you actually ultimately choose. I mean, so a little bit longer, but I'll stop now. <laughs> I guess I'll, well, I was going to say I'm going to back clean up, but I think that's the fourth spot and this is the fifth, so <laughs> another sports metaphor. I'm working on it. Um, <laughs> I appreciate this discussion very much. This is exactly what I hoped for, which was very thoughtful input. I think I'm getting a pretty clear consensus from the board. Uh, I agree with everything that's been said. I think we're, we're really much, pretty much on the same page here. If I might venture to summarize, I think that you know, it seems to be a clear consensus that the Minuteman appointment in particular is unique uh, for reasons that have been articulated. And there seems to be a uh, consensus interest in advertising the uh, uh, opening for, for nominations and certainly welcoming that of the self-nomination of, of the incumbent, Mr. Ritterman, for who we thank for his service in the last three years. Um, at this point, um, I'm comfortable if the board wants me to go with that consensus to, to spin up a process that could, in, could include um, asking a couple of you uh, an update soon to be on a, on a subcommittee. Um, or if anyone wants to make a specific motion tonight, we could check, check in with Mr. Rit uh, Mr. Ritterman, Mr. Heim, on the appropriateness of that. Um, I, get, I guess whatever you and Attorney Heim think is appropriate after we, you do the outreach, uh, get the names. Um, I don't know if it's appropriate to poll the board to say if there are 5, 10, 15 applicants, mm -hmm. do we mirror the process? And we can have this at the goals meeting too. Do we mirror the, mirror the process of the zoning board of appeal appointments to which it would fall to the chair and vice chair mm. and or his or her designee? Because mm -hmm. um, right. it can't be three of us. Um, right. So yeah, I guess yeah. uh, as, as we go forward, uh, whatever the chair and vice chair think. Um, first, I guess, see what the interest is. Right. Um, it, it, if it turns out that it's, it's just Mr. Ruderman that sort of right answers the question for us, for three but people, I think we, we, we yeah, still yeah. need to have the uh, expanded discussion at our goals meeting um, about uh, just what we're discussing right now. If we do get 5, 10, 15, mm -hmm. is it the ZBA process we mirror? Is the ZBA process that we do um, 
something we want to continue on or change in some way. But so I guess for this, it's sort of a moving, not target, but a moving uh, goal um, in uh, whatever way appropriate for us to take the next steps. But definitely we need to see what the universe is. Thank yeah. you. Well said, Mr. Mahan. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I concur. I think that's exactly right to, to really think about this in a, in a more systematic and expanded way. So uh, my intention will be then um, to proceed working with the, with the board staff to uh, promote the opportunity that the board sends to the board uh, to, to advertise this availability and we'll work up a process as quickly as we can to notify uh, the community and particularly the Minuteman community and to come up with some outreach. And then, again, I think as Mrs. Mahan suggested, depending on the volume of, of uh, applicants, if we have them, then, then I can uh, figure out if we need to, to do a subcommittee to get that, Mr. Hurd. Yeah, I just note for the Housing Authority appointment, we had what I consider a similar situation. Mm -hmm. And I believe we just took the app, anyone that applied, we gave a short interview. Mm -hmm. And I don't recall it if we whittled it down and then went from there. But, I mean, I, I think... Was that a direct interview from the board or, or like a... a I believe we just had them all on Zoom. Yeah. And I think having... Not that the ZBA is different from this, but, I mean, the this to me feels like something that a full board interview process, unless 35 people apply, mm -hmm. and I guess we can... We can see from there, but if four people apply, I think it's appropriate to have four people come and pitch the board as to why they are appropriate for this spot, and the board can make a nomination and a vote. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that sounds right to me. Okay. Thank you again very much uh, for the very helpful discussion, and uh, we will get right to work on this. You didn't need, I guess it's just a discussion. You don't need a vote or anything. You're fine. Okay. Yes, sir. It's just a discussion. You didn't need a vote or anything. So That's correct. Yeah. 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 Unless a member wanted to make a motion, but I think that it was pretty clear we were fine with that one. So, Okay. Speaking of discussions without votes, uh, item 14, discussion, overnight parking pilot proposal. Uh, I've got, I, I know we're listening to two board members, but I think really it's, it's Mr. Diggins here at the, at the plate. Cool. There's another yeah, one. Well, well, we're, we're the team here. You know, so you, yeah, you guys, you guys proceed. Yeah, but since I, I, I wrote this out, I'll, I'll just take the, the lead tonight. So you, you've seen it, you know, I hope. You know, and it's a pretty much be to run the discretionary, the current discretionary overnight parking pilot you know, alongside uh, non-discretionary overnight parking pilot. And the non-discretionary will issue about you know, 150, you know, um, permits, you know, and they would be on a first come, first serve basis, you know, and I think uh, perhaps the big question for us to answer would be whether we want to limit the, uh, them to one per household or not, you know, and, and so uh, for me, I mean, it's really a matter of seeing what the demand is, you know, so, so I'm inclined to you know, allow more than one um, per household, you know, and, and because at the end of the pilot, we are going to evaluate, you know, and that will that evaluation will be as extensive as we want. You know, but for me, a big part of that would be you know, where are these permits coming from? Uh, part of the permit process would have the person give us a reason for why uh, they want the permit, you know, and hopefully they'll give us an honest answer because it's not going to determine whether they get the permit or not, you know, and, and alongside this, we can also do surveys. It will be up to us you know, as to what's in those surveys, you know, uh, to try and gauge me what kind of demand there is, especially if it's over-described, you know. So, so that's where I am, you know, open to questions. Um, try to be brief, Mahan. I just want to let it, I'm coming from right now a place of no, yeah. and I just want to explain why. Uh -huh. it, but I can change that at the next meeting or whatever, but um, I pretty much, have, I think I've been saying that I'm no. Just that um, my memory is, you know, this came from a town meeting member in Precinct 4. I can see her. I think I remember her name correctly, but I don't want to say it incorrectly. I'm not sure if she still is a town meeting. Sylvia Dominguez. Sylvia Dominguez. Oh, I see. 
you would have got the first name, not the last name. Um, and it was a concern over uh, uh, financial, economic uh, issues, and uh, th that's where it came forward, and we, we started exploring that. And, and, and really what I see before us, including do we allow more than one per household, we, in just my opinion, really strayed from what it is we started down the road to try to accomplish here, as well as keeping in mind, you know, our net zero goals, our 2050 goals, our 2030 goals, um, uh, uh, alternative uh, transportation. And um, I do know that the transport, I'm going to say it wrong. I, I think maybe, I'm not sure if it's Arlington Bicycle Advisory Committee and or Transportation Advisory Committee that has contacted us and sent some correspondence um, that have had concerns um, as well as uh, uh, we've all read it and so I, I won't encapsulate what they've said but I didn't see them as in endorsing this either right now but I also think I picked up on that they um, weren't involved in the process enough either so you know maybe their opinion shouldn't be as loud or not but um, I still would like to uh, go back to the process that the select board does have. Um, I sometimes feel like we're, we've gone down this road because when we do have uh, overnight parking waiver hearings, um, sometimes they are difficult votes and, you know, are we trying to skirt that, that we don't have to do that? And I know that I can't think of one person that's come before the bo board with an overnight parking request that also had a financial economic consideration that they wanted to be taken into account that the board, the previous board of selectmen, the current select board has always uh, granted that. Um, so uh, I, I would not be in favor of if for some reason I went from no to a okay, yes, do the pilot, but uh, approving more than one per household, I think really gets away from, you know, are we just trying to find people that, you know, well, I don't want to have to move the car, and, and are we encouraging more cars that, you know, well, you know, my daughter's fiancé, soon-to-be husband, stays here, and, and he or she, our partner, needs to park. I mean, I just don't see, I, at the most, I would say to my colleagues, if I'm still a no and other people are a yes and it prevails, um, I would just say I don't see why there's a need for, for more than one. Um, just keep it in line with some of the other uh, initiatives that are running sort of concurrently um, with this, as well as I, I keep beating the same drum, but how did we start going down this road? And, and what's the road that we're overnight parking on now? And I just seen, in my opinion, it's gone so far afield of what the original is. So um, I'm still a no, I could be a yes, um, but I'm definitely, if I was a yes, I would and am advocating for, it should not be more than one per household. Um, and I really think one of the tantamount um, uh, requirements after this, whether the pilot is approved and happens and or if the pilot's not approved and we um, go back to uh, the, the initial process, maybe we need to expand on um, economic uh, diversity so that people know that that's an option. Um, and I don't think, and I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Bowen. Your turn. Yeah, I mean, I think we've said this at past meetings. It's a pilot. We want to create a pile of the mirror is what we would do going forward to get the best results. I mean, I personally think that it should be limited to one per household just because roommates with four, you know, four unrelated people that have four cars, and I don't think that's what we're, what we're looking for. And again, if the majority of the board thinks that we should allow more than one per household, then fine. <laughs> but I just think it squares some of the concerns that we're receiving from residents who are against the parking permit just for congestion, for climate resiliency goals. Um, so I, I think it should be one 
per household. Um, I raise this again, and I have no problem with it being in the policy. And I know it has always been a concern that if you're going to get one, you have to park in front of your house or this language to allow for uneven parking. I don't know what enforcement looks like with that, with as far as the Arlington Police Department have to enforce overnight parking restrictions and make sure that someone has a, term, a, a permit, how they know that that car is associated with that address. I guess they can run the plates, but it's an extra step. Um, as I read the policy, it still seems, in, I don't know if this is by intent, or maybe I'm just not seeing it. My eyes aren't what they used to be. But it still seems like we're, cre if this is the pilot language, that there has to be a stated rationale for the, for the why you're asking for the overnight yeah. parking permit yeah. as far as handicap or hardship. Um, engineering and possibility of having a driveway, which I think that language has strictly been interpreted in the past to essentially say that if there's any way to get a driveway on there, no matter what you have to pay, then you don't qualify for a permit. It was my understanding that if we're going to do the, the permit, we weren't really going to ask for a rationale for it. If someone asked, requested it, wanted to pay the fee, then they'd be able to do it. Um, and I think going forward, we would just have kind of a case-by-case -case analysis. But I didn't think that as part of the permit, they were, they were going to have to make a case as to why they needed it. But I don't know, maybe I, it's been a while since <laughs> I think we've had a lot of discussion on this. Can I just answer that? Yep. So, so it's not, they just tell us why. It doesn't determine whether they get it or not. It's just a point of information in the pilot made for those who get the non-discretionary permit. We're simply asking them why it is that you want the permit. But it won't. For the data reasons? Yeah, for data reasons. Okay. It can help us gauge, gauge what kind of demand there is for it. And that's a non-discretionary. You know, uh, The discretionary will continue to run. So our current policy continues to run. So, so if someone doesn't want to get a permit that's going to cost them $360 a year, $30 a month because it'll be prorated, you know, they can come in as they've always done, you know, and make their case. I mean, and then in that case, I mean, I think it's like $80. You I mean, you pay a $75 setup, I think, and then $80 every other – after that. And that would continue. I mean, uh, that isn't subject to the time constraints of the pilot. I mean, they'll get to renew – uh, the beginning of next year, so this is not either or, it's really both and, I mean, with the pilot kind of overlaid on our current, on our current uh, discretionary policy. And then, again, I'm sorry if it's in there and I'm not seeing it. Are there any restrictions on the pilot as far as Mass Ave? No. Because I know traditionally the Arlington Police Department has taken the, has, for safety reasons, resisted having parking on Mass Ave because that was one of the solutions that we had thought of that had been proposed before is Mass Ave bigger and maybe for some of the, the like in East Arlington where the tighter streets just permit or allow parking overnight on Mass Ave but then I know the police department before has resisted that I know I'm sure some of the businesses would like to keep those spots open. I don't like in business districts. You can't park in front of your house unless, I guess, you could hypothetically if you're in an apartment above. But then you have a, a car there that, that would ultimately be subject to to time limits that we impose on Mass Ave, anyways. But I don't know. Just a consideration. I, I think for the pilot, it's fine. But long term, it's something to think about. And maybe check in with the police department to see if they have any concerns about allowing parking on Mass Ave. Mr. Corsa, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Diggins, for, for your work bringing this back before the board. I mean, my name is there, but Mr. Diggins has really, did, more recently has done the, um, by far the, 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 the bulk of the work on this. I appreciate that. Um, I think just a couple of comments as to um, 
Mr. Hurd said, I'd, I'd be inclined to limit it to one per household as well in a, in, a, in a pilot arrangement. And the other thing that came out of some of our discussions, and, and again, this, this pilot discussion has been going on for a long time, and originally it started that we would just open it up to everybody and just see what would happen. Now this is, is more limited. But from the feedback that we received, um, because there are different categories of, of overnight parking, Permits like you have the emergency of the family member visiting for a weekend. I came away from the forums thinking that it's it's going to be much harder to say one side of the street. Um, and I think if we're limiting the number of non-discretionary to, to judge demand, but we're still allowing the 14 days for people who are visiting and there's some other situations, I I think in my mind I'm almost back to saying you receive the permit, but it's in front of your house because I, I really do see a difficulty in terms of having people park only on one side of the street where these other programs are still going to continue and where potentially the demand isn't going to be as great as maybe what we envisioned originally. Um, so I, I just, just, just a, a, a comment on that. Um, I think it's something you have this starting on July 1. I think it's given the feedback tonight and, and for the discussion, it's probably something that we can do if we get it on an agenda in June, if there's consensus among, or if there's at least three of us who are voting for it. But I, um, those, are, those are just my two areas there. I do think it's important to try to get feedback from staff, whether it's through the town manager's office, police department, that some of these reviews can still take place during the pilot period uh, as well. And I'd like to have that to the benefit of other board members before there's a final vote. Yeah, I think as Mr. DeCorsi went through his points, it, it kind of struck me that we had envisioned, I think when we were talking about odd even parking, this idea that, you know, there's cars lying in the streets with 150 permits, we're just not going to see that. Um, and certainly during the day, there's probably more congestion. There's a lot more cars parked when they can park out in front of the, the street, their house legally. And that's when there's more traffic and they seem to survive. And at night, there's not going to be a lot of traffic going up and down the streets. So it, it may be beneficial to just limit in, to in front of one's own house. Um, and it certainly... It, I thought of a situation, I guess, where it's odd even parking and you're parking in front of your across the street neighbor's house at night and they're like, hey, why are you parking here? And like, because the select board told us we couldn't park in front of our house. <laughs> so it probably would make sense given the limited number of permits to do that. Um, and we'll see, you know, what the data. Yeah, yeah, again, I don't envision that this will cause major clutter in the streets just given the the current operations. So um, I'll speak now to my own thoughts, if I may. Um, I think at this point I would vote against this, although in its current form and, and maybe anything too much like it. Um, but I'm very happy to put this on the agenda. I think if I get an indication tonight, uh, particularly that there would be members who would consider voting for it, you know, I certainly res respect that. Um, so if you haven't made that clear in this meeting, that would be very useful um, to me. And I would certainly support whatever the, the majority of the board uh, wants to do. Because I think there is merit to the idea. I just, I'm, I'm not personally persuaded that it's, it's uh, ready to be implemented even on a temporary basis. Some of my concerns are, and, and this is something we could easily change, you know, I think 200 permits could be enough to have a significant unexpected event effect. We could reduce that, we could start at the small number and, and, and go higher. So um, if we did do this, by the way, and I'm, and I'm saying I couldn't be persuaded to vote for it, but that's where I'm at now. I think I would definitely be a one per household uh, camp I'm not, I'm ambivalent about the side of the street. I think honestly I'd want to know what the, what our experts in, in the police department and the town manager's office and in other relevant offices, uh, the town manager would see, rel, uh, would seem appropriate to give us some advice about the, the likely impact or the feasibility 
of that, uh, particularly with respect to existing waivers and, and, uh, and permits. Um, I think my underlying, it has, been, it has been a good process over the last year or so that we've been talking about this. It, it did start, as, as my colleague Mrs. Mahan said, with a, a desire to help people in specific situations. And I think that it's been a useful exercise to explore a pretty large map of, of how the, what this could look like. Do we do a town-wide, just to abolish the overnight ban altogether? And I think that quickly moved to, well, if we did that, we would have to institute permit parking for everybody, like Cambridge does, for instance, to, and then we, we had some good feedback from public forums, that there was concern that, that maybe that was over-solving for the problem. And, you know, if, if the problem is to help help people who, 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 for whom the current exceptions and waivers uh, and discretionary permits aren't helping, then how do we do that? And for me, this doesn't quite hit that mark yet. I think that, I see, I see the point in a lightweight uh, trial, and I, and I like the word trial more than pilot, because for me, pilot in, involves more systematic study than I think we're actually proposing to do. I think we're really just saying, how, we're looking at demand and uptake, right? If we did a trial, uh, that was more or less whoever wants a permit can get one, and we asked for some data. I don't know that that represents, I think to Mr. Hurd's point, uh, how well that matches what we think we would do long term. You know, I think that we would see how many people would, on a six month or a four month basis, like to park on the street for a while. Probably not going to buy a new car because it's temporary. I'm not. Sh I'm not convinced that we will learn what we need to learn for whatever the program is. I'm not. I'm not sure what the long term program actually would look like. And I don't find myself persuaded that what we would learn from this trial would inform what we want to do. Uh, we've done some good work, and I appreciate the work uh, that my colleagues have done. I'm also aware that we are primarily a policy board, and I am cautious about do-it-yourself uh, transportation and planning, and, and, and respectful of the expertise that we have on the board. But I'm aware, and I think that the others uh, in the forums have, have said that, you know, the town has limited staffing resources and even limited resources in the wonderful folks on the TAC. But, but we ha this hasn't really deeply involved any kind of systematic study, analysis, proposal kind of way involved uh, the expertise of the town departments that the town manager brings to bear or an outside consultant if we wanted to go that direction. And, and I know that it, this may just be a difference of opinion about the, the best way to proceed. I think I'm hearing that a suggestion that we just see what happens, and that is a valid way to, to do it. For me, I am worried enough about unintended consequences and knowing what we don't know and what we don't have the expertise in to be cautious about that because I think that, for me, if we do even a trial basis or a pilot, it is very difficult to get out from that precedent. To, to, if we start the ball moving, I think that I'm not sure what would happen. It, we can pull it off. You know, we can pull it back. We can, we can say the program's off if things go, things go wrong. Uh, but not only unintended consequences, I really want to learn from, from whatever, if we do something, I really want to learn from that. I think there's a lot that a, pilot, a true pilot study, if it, was, if it was adequately scoped and planned and drafted, could, could say, well, let, what is the impact on certain kinds of streets? What's the impact on, on car ownership? And I know that that's really long and hairy, and, and, and that's, that's hard to do. But I think we've pitched to, this, to, this, to the public as a pilot study, and really I think what it's come down to is we, you know, we, there's a proposal to issue an, a number of permits pretty much to whoever asks for one with maybe a couple of, of limited um, criteria. And, um, you know, I think the learning would just be who wants to park more, you know, on, on the streets. And that, that's, not a, that's not invalid to learn. But for me, it doesn't, it doesn't speak to helping specific people in specific use cases. So I, I realize I'm, not, I'm the one being uh, quite long-winded. But there's a lot, it's, too, it's just too loose for me right now. If, we, if there was another proposal, if there's three members here who would indicate uh, tonight that they would be inclined, likely to vote positive, I'm happy to put this on the on agenda. So I hope that my, my, um, my um, negative comments or my, my things would be seen as constructive criticisms to make that kind of proposal better um, for, for what we do. Because it is not without appreciation for the thinking or respect for a different point of view of how we should do this. Mr. Hurd? I mean, I think we've gone through a long process. We've involved a lot of the community. And we've heard 
both positive and negative things about the pilot. I mean, I think it's it's a pilot. I think we make clear to people, we're going to collect information from people and make clear to them that this is going to be limited engagement and there is an end date and we can send reminders to them that, you know, as of this date, you're not allowed to park in front of your house anymore. Um, and I think on both sides of the issue, we've seen this kind of extremes where it's like this is incredible demand and we can test that and we've seen people that are against the pilot that said oh it's going to have this crazy negative effect and we can test that too and I think in both cases is it's not going to pan out quite as much as it was presented to us so I mean I think if we have a limited number of permits limit to in front of people's houses, which again, I'm fine with the language, it's just it's the enforcement, I, I don't know what that looks like. I think we can loop in our amazing APD officers to with suggestions of whether or not that language is clear enough, get a little clarification to see if they want to include Mass Ave. If they do, that's fine. Um, and then limit one per household, did I say that right? <laughs> um, I think I'm fine having a limited pilot and again, to see what, if anything, to see what, what comes of it. So, I mean, that's where I am. So I like the word trial, you know, uh, because, we, because I think the, if it's undersubscribed, the, you know, it may, that may answer a lot in itself and the, the trial just becomes, the, you know, becomes part of the, po the policy. Although, the behavior may very well be different in the trial, I mean, and we have to be cautious about that. You know, look, if I could, fig if I could have figured out the how to do a pilot that would give us an answer in any reasonable amount of time, that would be different than just change the policy outright. I mean, um, I would have proposed that. You know, and, and I think I know enough. You know. I am not an expert in transportation, but I've been doing it, you know, um, uh, a fair amount with the MBTA, and I've been a member of TAC. I just don't see a pilot, you know, in any year or two time frame that's going to tease out the kind of answers I think that you would find uh, satisfactory, that I would find satisfactory. So that's why all along it's like, let's just see uh, what the – doesn't break, <laughs> and so uh, 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 and, 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 um, and I'm going to make one more push me for more than one per household because I, I kind of feel out in in the east, I mean, uh, where you have a lot of adults, I mean, in in a household, I mean, that, that may have you know um, more than one car. I mean, that might be the place where you see the demand for more. Than one, and, and, and it could be very helpful, you know, to to I mean, folks in, in those situations where they just don't have the option. I mean, and and we heard cases where you just you just have it's not a matter of convenience; it's really a matter of like you have the you know, uncooperative, you know, neighbors, you know, that really are making it difficult for people I mean, to move things around, you know, early in the morning or even in the evening, you know, and and. Um, so I, I just put it out there, but look, me, and, and I, I can easily just say, look, me, just get the one <laughs> and get your three votes and go. <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and, and if that's how it shakes out, that's how it shakes out. But I just need to think, you know, I'll, I'll put in one more plug me, for um, me, more than one per house, especially, you know, in this pilot slash trial phase. Now, if we get, if this thing gets oversubscribed, that will be an interesting situation in itself. And it may be me from seeing the reasons that people give for why, you know, they would like to be a part of it. It could give us some sense of how to conduct being a pilot, you know, later on. But but, but it, I'm all for bringing more people into the process, I mean, and helping us think it out, whether it be, you know, sooner as part of the next phase of this or if we decide not to go forward and we still want to go forward with this, but we still want to explore this me for another two or three years. <laughs> I'm fine with that, you know. I'll bring in more people and say, hey, you know, we'll have the overnight parking, you know, study committee, you know. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and appreciate 
everybody's comments and, and again what, what you've done here mr diggins and, and for me i'm at a point where i'd just like to get some more information and, and i think that's where the when i say more information from the trial or, or, or from the pilot and i come from a place where i live in a private way my whole neighborhood is private ways people park in the street they can park in the street i've lived there for almost 30 years and it it works itself out and and, and again it's it's not like every neighborhood. There's other issues that are unique to, to some neighborhoods. But I, talking to people in my neighborhood about it and, um, and, and receiving some feedback, it just feels to me that we're 20% of the streets in Arlington. You can park overnight, and most people park in front of the house. Sometimes you might have a few extra neighbors, and you might be along the side. It, I, I'm not aware of any complaints in, 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 in my area, and it's, it's probably 8 to 10 streets that – that that happens and and um i would just like to see some information so for me it's not a huge leap to say okay let's try overnight parking for a period of time because it's been going on for for a while and i see certain situations where there are, there are people you know, particularly during the pandemic but since then people have come back and um there may be an extra car there for a period of time and and people are generally parking and in front of their house i haven't seen people buy two or three extra cars and again there are concerns we have no idea what the demand will be we don't know whether there'll be a lot there'll be a little but i i feel i'm at a point where i want to find out something i want to move forward even if it's just small incremental and get more information and i think mr diggins is right i don't think we could design something that is going to get the feedback that that we're all looking for but i think it, it'd be helpful to get some information just to see if we should expand things should we change the discretionary policy so it's been a lot of talk and, and for me i'm not maybe word for word right now but i'm i'm, I'm ready to to try something and and uh, with a few tweaks between now and uh, when we ultimately vote just speaking for myself thank you this is really helpful i think i think i'm hearing three voices saying that they'd like to give this a go and i will be very glad to to look forward to uh seeing a vote for that my personal request to to the proponent here, um, would, first of all, I think I'm persuadable. I think this has been very very useful. Um, would be I would strongly request that that we do get input from the APD, but any other officials that the town manager would suggest who, because I think that he will have the best insight into who should look at this and just help us make this the best trial that it, that it could be if that's the direction the board would vote um, before we get there. And um, and go from there. So, any other uh, final comments? And just, you know, I have sent it to you know, the town manager and asked him you know, to forward it to Excellent. whoever he thinks he should be would, be would be willing or should give feedback. And so, and I heard what people said about one side of the street. So, so probably that will come out. You know, uh, unless we get feedback, I mean, that that should you know, we will have another discussion and hopefully both. One one um, final question I have is, have we talked about you know the, the, the I've always liked the idea that these would be associated with a with a snow spot in the in the town lots for our existing waivers and, and discretionary permits would would it be possible to uh, you know if we were to do this if they come to us and say well I'd like a, I'd like one of those emergency slow snow stops because I have to move my car during a snow emergency. Would that be something that we uh, maybe ask Mr. Town Manager on that point? Um, any idea? <laughs> without, without warning, uh, <laughs> any off the cuff idea about? I did ask the, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I did ask the DPW Commissioner today. I read him the part here, here that said that holders of an overnight permit will be able to park on the street in front of their residence. Uh, oh, no, I'm sorry, that's the wrong part. Uh, where it refers to uh, the fact that people have access to the lots and that they will be, oh, we expected to use the reserve spot in a lot when there's street cleaning or snow emergency. And I asked him, don't we have to clear the lots too? And he said, no, we let people get in there. So, uh, in fact, I think. So they can do it now? Yes. Yeah. So that may, not be, that may not be a particular stress point then? Hey, well, I, 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 I kind of heard your question differently, and I'll follow up maybe with um, um, the, the board at that, you know, because I know that for those who get, the, you know, they get to park in the lots now. I don't know if that's different than those who get, like, waivers, you know, so, so, so it's like for those who 
be it, or maybe doing the 14-day waiver or whatever. Like, I think we need to go back and review some more. You know, I don't think they get uh, signed a, 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 a lot spot, you know. So are there – The are, permits that we issue through our office for – discretionary permits are for in front of their home. They do not get a permit. It does not equal a spot in the lot during a snow emergency. So, so people that park in lots are actually, they don't come through us whatsoever. They're downstairs and they're issued through the treasurer's office. And that spot would allow them, right. you know, they park their day and they can do night. Oh, I just, I thought yeah. I mean. So then the question is how many is How it many there? spots there are and how many they've already issued would be through the treasurer's office. Right. No, the other question is, though, how many I mean, permits are, or waivers are have we issued you know, that don't get spots in the lots? They're temporary. So they're usually, again, just for like a medical if somebody has hospice coming or there's a financial. And most of the time, if they're in the proximity of a lot school, we ask them to park there. We don't ask them to park on the street. Right. So most of, we don't have that many, maybe a handful okay. of people. All right. All right. I'd say anywhere from 10 to 15. Okay. Oh, okay. Right. That, that's, yeah, that's, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. That, thanks. That's good information. Thank sure. you. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. All right. Yeah. Okay. So I think we're good on this. Uh, thank you very much for this. And uh, that, I believe, I'll check in with my vice chair here. Have I missed anything? Because it has been known to happen. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the next item on the board uh, on the agenda looks different, but really isn't. Mm -hmm. um, I've been wanting to do this. Actually, I thought about this for a few months. Um, I don't know what it says about me that I think contemplate being chair, and I think this is the one thing I want to do as a legacy, <laughs> is nomenclature. Uh, the new business item ha is, 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 the town council has informed me, is really a, a legacy from before open meeting law, which very clearly puts some lim limits on what we can discuss, and you know, we can't have an interactive board discussion that we haven't posted you know, two, two days in advance. And um, it always struck me as a little bit is, is you know a, a, a good tradition, but potentially confusing to residents or new new people to meetings that they might it might look like oh well is this is this a free for all that you can just put new business on that mm. that you haven't you know, that you're going to discuss that you haven't noticed and of course we we can't do that and we don't do that. Um, so looking back in my experience to what this time has been used for, it seems like it's pretty much a good announcement time with the occasional sporting report from our local teams um, or anything else that the board wants to say. So that's it. I think I'm not trying to constrain what any board or staff members say in this. Uh, I do this clearly for, uh, for the clarity of the public. So with that said, uh, Ms. Marr, do you have any announcements? No, thank you. <laughs> Mr. Town Manager. I have three now that you've opened this up. This is great. Um, <laughs> one is uh, you will get a memo next week. Uh, under correspondence receipt from the uh, planning director, uh, just notifying you uh, that we are going to wait a year to apply to the state for MathWorks grant for Appleton Street. There are significant enough parking issues involved with a Mass Ave and Appleton. Uh, plus, I think we've become more and more aware of the issues around the MIRAC development and the ingress and egress from that slot. Uh, the, I thought I would just mention it tonight because I know there's been a lot of interest on the board for this, so um, I just wanted to give you a heads up and then you will get a uh, notice uh, next time from the planning director board. The second thing that I know has been a matter of interest on the board is the state of parking meters. Um, as of last Friday, we had checked and the meters had still not been shipped from their, uh, the company in Canada that's shipping them. Um, so we have put out a notice uh, telling people at this point that we're not expecting to change them out until, or have them changed out until July 1st. Um, we put that notice out because that was sort of, we are hoping, the long range of the time uh, for which we will still not have meters and still not be enforcing uh, the parking meters. Uh, we do continue to look at it, um, but I just want to let you know that's the status. And then finally. Oh, anticipation. <laughs> Those of you who have not seen the Boston Globe today, I just want to point out that my picture is on the front page. There's a good article here about um, a First Amendment audit that we went through where some, I don't know what the technical term would be, cuckoo heads, um, came in and filmed a lot of our uh, staff, harassed them, 
uh, under the name of saying that they were exercising their First Amendment rights. Uh, really, as I said in the article, I don't see what it has to do with the First Amendment. Um, it was just a way to uh, get a lot more hits on their YouTube channel uh, to make some of our staff very uncomfortable. Uh, it was an unfortunate incident. We are not alone. There are many other communities around the Boston area uh, that have been subject to this. Uh, the fellow who does this does it all over the country. Um, anyway, I did want to point it out because uh, it has affected us here in Arlington. Uh, that I think is a good story in the Globe. I will send a PDF of it to the clerk's office because you have to subscribe the, to the Globe to be able to find it online. So I will send that and share it with all of you. Thank you, Mr. Pooler. And I was remiss in passing over Attorney Heim, who is still joining us remotely. Did you have any announcements, sir? No announcements, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Mahan. Ms. Shilva. Um, I think three quick things. The first one is, um, as we all know, I uh, want to congratulate one of our crossing guards, Linda Corella, from Hardy School, um, which I believe it's going to be in your house, a celebration, but she was one of three in the state. Uh, there were about 135, 133 people that were nominated, um, and she was one of the three in the state. Um, that was awarded, the, I think it's called like the Crossing Guard Champions, and it's also tied into the Safe Routes to Schools. Um, and uh, I believe June 8th, there'll be something at the State House um, uh, to have the ceremony through MassDOT and, and uh, other things. And I know um, members of our legislative delegation as well as perhaps our chair will be in the State House that day and can carry our personal thanks. But I do want to say thank you to uh, Linda Corella down at Hardy School as well as all of our crossing guards. Um, I could give them all an award. Every time I go by, whether it's um, Downing Square with five to 500 ways to enter there, whether it's Mass Ave in Appleton uh, in the morning or in the afternoon with the solar glare. But I'm um, very proud of Linda Corella and uh, her and her uh, mom, Natalie, have done so much for the town, and I'm so glad she got that recognition. So uh, the second thing is, um, as we all know, uh, the day after the uh, discussion at town meeting, which centered around Poets Connor, and several people have asked me if the town was going to be able to pick up that project, and I have told them, at the sake of being incorrect, the town manager, the answer would be no to the approximate $10 million project um, uh, that Belmont Hill, which encompassed lots of things, that that's, I myself personally don't see that that's something um, we could do. But um, this board and, and myself forwarded to uh, the town manager and the park and rec director um, who have Poets Corner in the queue to be discussed at a park and recre recreation me meeting. And I do appreciate that in the past uh, 12 months or less, there have been s uh, about six, I think six parks, playgrounds um, that have been renovated. And I do know that Park and Rec, um, besides Poets Corner, has Robbins Farm being discussed, has the Hills Hill Project, has Monotomy Rocks Park, uh, as well as closing out uh, the previous six, uh, it's more like punch list stuff left on that. So um, I, I really do appreciate everybody who spent time on that issue, but especially our colleagues on, on the Park and Rec Commission um, for not only work around Poets Corner, but previous and moving forward. And then um, uh, we all won't be here next Monday because it'll be Memorial Day and we'll have our veteran services that. Uh, Jeff Chungo is um, uh, organizing, and I'm, uh, it's an event that I, it's very near and dear to all our hearts, um, especially coming from a veteran family, which I'm very proud of, uh, and have nothing but accolades to say about our veterans. Um, and because of that, I won't say anything more on that. Um, but uh, I'm also really excited to hear, again, from uh, 
if I get it wrong, I apologize of my husband, dad, father-in-law, all my veterans in the family. I believe it's um, Major General Bill William Rapp, who I met one day when I was visiting Christine Crone and Tachi. It's their neighbor, uh, who lives right across, um, who Jeff Chunglo, um, a few years ago, uh, was able to um, connect with and utilize. Uh, the, the Major General has given seven talk, several talks, um, not just around veterans, but around his service, but um, a Native American, uh, one particular talk that really morphed into a, an even bigger event than that. So um, um, our Veteran Services Director always never fails us in terms of the program that he has put together um, along with his wife, Diane, um, th that uh, the speakers are always someone that are, that are very inspirational. And this is the first time I can remember that we have such a dignitary who also is an Arlington resident. So I'm very excited about that. And I know um, it'll be a great event. And if you can't be there in person, thank goodness for ACMI that's going to be able to uh, broadcast it and replay it. So that's it for my new business. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Mahoney. <coughs> Thank you. I would also like to congratulate Ms. Carella for her award. It's certainly well deserved. Um, I drive through that intersection every day when I'm going to pick up the kids and certainly see her there, very attentive. And it is, as a former Hardy student, <laughs> I know it, it, there can be a lot of, at that intersection, so it's an important intersection to have a very well attuned crossing guard and Linda is up to the task. Um, do you have, this is going to sound like a little inside baseball. Ooh. It's, there's a herd field rededication. Um, what was the last, what was the name of the field again? Herd field. Um, no, herd. H-U-R-D. <laughs> um, but there's a former uh, select board member that, has been all over me to make sure that I was spreading the word on this and spearheading this event. Uh, but it is, while the name certainly bears my name, it's really a celebration of the work of the Parks and Rec um, Commission, um, the CPA, it is fu that funded the, the um, renovation of the field that was long overdue, just like poets. So there will be an event, there will be Speakers, we have uh, Leslie Mayer from the Parks and Recs Commission, and Park Commission CPA representative will speak, Jen Rotenberg from the Park Commission, um, myself, other town officials. Then a first pitch will be thrown out by two fifth generation members of the Heard family, which I am fourth generation, so you can do the math there. And then that will be followed by the f first game at the new field will be the two AAA powerhouses, the Giants versus the Dodgers. Um, so if you're in the area, you should definitely come and watch that game as well. When again? Yeah. Say again? When again? When? Oh, sorry. It is Thursday, May 25th. The ceremony starts, the dedication starts at 530. I'm going to be, I'm going to be in Annapolis, sorry. <laughs> I would come. Yeah. To see Dylan and Leslie's new field. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Mr. DeCourcy. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. A couple of things. First, I, I uh, want to acknowledge and, and thank our fire department for the uh, work that they had done on the, the, the fire mm. on Dudley Street uh, since our last meeting, and that was potentially a very dangerous um, situation with the materials that were inside that building, and it did a great job, and, and nobody was injured. There was a, a moment there to scare, but um, happy that, uh, that, that, that it was extinguished, and with a lot of other businesses around there and the materials is potentially a very dangerous situation. And that came to mind um, in terms of the great work our fire department's doing. Um, just this afternoon, I was working from home, and there was a appeared to be a fire, um, it was a fire, I think, at, at a neighbor's house. Um, and the uh, fire department came and quickly extingu extinguished it. Um, and it, it is a homeowner there who's living alone who had come out and, and uh, um, talked to the firefighters. They did their work and spent some time with him. Um, he felt good about the, the work. There was some um, 
an, an issue behind his house that they, they extinguished. And uh, also in, in the last month since our last meeting, my mother-in-law um, had a health issue up the, the heights and uh, the, she was brought to, to, to Mount Auburn, nothing serious. But um, my wife drove in the rescue truck with, to, to, the, to the hospital and, and Mary uh, and, and my mother-in-law Ann um, were very relieved at the, at the great attention they received. And uh, just when you see these examples in your neighborhood and, and um, um, we saw with Dudley Street, when the bell rings, you never know what you're going to. And uh, they came and today was a situation where it was uh, easy to put down, relatively speaking, right? There's nothing that's really easy, but uh, I just want to thank them for the great work that they do. Thank you, Mr. DeCourcy. Well said. Mr. Diggins. I have no announcements or the business. Very well. I don't either. <laughs> <laughs> Everything that I was going to say has been said, and that is just great. Motion to adjourn. Second. <laughs> On a motion to turn, adjourn by Vice Chair heard, seconded by Mrs. Mahan. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? We are adjourned. Ooh,